Hello and welcome to the Queer Monkey Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, and on behalf of our Board of Directors, our advisors, our volunteers and supporting members, we do want to thank you for joining us today. The Kulimangi Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is reflected in three main areas, uh, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science while advancing, conserving, and restoring a direct experience of that deeper human connection to all of life. It is part of our mission to expand our own experiential research with that multidisciplinary understanding that's available to us today. So as an educational institution, we take an open approach and we invite scholars and related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this conversation for exploration. And on these sunny discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics from the arts to the sciences and everything in between. And you're welcome to visit our website at queermongayinstitute.com. All of our presentations are free. And of course, as a nonprofit organization, we invite you to become a supporting member, join our community circle, and we thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Cuyamaga Institute. We asked some questions today. When did the first peoples arrive in the Americas? Evidence mounts for dates long before the end of the last ice age. Today, our guest, an archeologist and a geologist, shares some of the oldest evidence of human migrations from Siberia into Northern Canada, across the Barren Land Bridge, which his research into climate, geology and archeology span says was navigable even at the heights of the ice age. How widely is the evidence and accepted and contested? Well, we'll find out. How far back might this story go? What DNA and cultural connections link the Paleolithic peoples of Siberia to the Americas? Well, our quest has always been, who are we? Where did we come from? And where are we going? Those age old and eternal questions. So those are, those are big questions to tackle. And we're on a journey in part of answering that. Uh, we're on a journey of celebration of our ancestors. We'll add another chapter today. Mm -hmm. How resilient they were. They survived. How adaptable. We now span the globe in multiple climates. How clever with their early tool making and innovations. How wise with their cosmology, philosophy, sustainable values. And how artistic their art still speaks so powerfully to us to this day. Mm. We've had many conversations with those who are keeping their wisdom traditions alive from a reframing of who were the Neanderthals, our kissing cousins, you could say, there was a little mating going on there, to how deep the instinct runs for making art. We're finding the most utilitarian objects, even if a half a million years ago, elevated as works of art, to reviving the sun Bushman methods of tracking game. Mm -hmm. now used for ecotourism and anti-poaching, to navigating the oceans, designing boats that cross the Pacific, which nearly covers half the globe by the stars, and long tradition of watching those stars, how star charts are found even in the murals of Lascaux and embedded deep in our mythologies, to the Gravedian globalization, I love that term, that same culture that painted all those caves of Europe, France, and Spain had vast trade networks during the Ice Age all over Europe and into Asia and into Siberia. And now we're finding that they may have extended that during the Ice Age to yet another continent, the Americas. So we have to look at that evidence. We have to credit our ancestors where credit is due. And this is evidence that's long been building with sites containing those famous footprints at the White Sands National Park dating back 26,000 years ago. That's just one of many sites. Mm -hmm. They're found all over Canada, we're gonna to hear today, Alaska, that looks so similar to those in Siberia. This looks like a connecting culture 
that's confirmed, but the question is how early on. So uh, there are two dates to keep in mind. The glass glacial maximum, 5,000 year stretch from 26,000 years ago to 19,000 years ago. But prior to that, the land bridge, it seems, was a little bit more climate friendly. It was to the mastodons and other flora and fauna. So why not to we humans? The ice age ended 13,000 years ago, melting off the ice and eventually submerging that land bridge. So yes, migrations happened in that window, but there's more and more evidence for multiple migrations. In fact, our guest says uh, back and forth, back and forth. It wasn't a one-way street. So I'm personally on a mission to reclaim those indigenous ancestors of ours. I know if I dial it back far enough, they're there mm -hmm. and they left a legacy and I can get to know them through that legacy. And that the earliest clues for the dates that they left during the ice age, they're early and they're fragmentary, but they're supposed to be so mysterious that we dare not guess at their meaning. But I think that if we can demonstrate that these cultures were all tied together, that they were linked at mm -hmm. some point, right. that by understanding this more recent, I can understand the past. And so I think it's a bridge to help us understand our own indigenous roots in the larger scheme of things, but also that we're one family. Right. We are one family of humanity. We're sharing one spaceship earth and we need to know that going forward. So, I mean, that's just me as a white girl's perspective. Imagine the native perspective. We're mm -hmm. gonna hear about that with Paulette Steves on June 25th. Okay. She's a native scholar of the Cree and the Metis tradition, who's also looked at these archeological sites. So we're gonna hear it from that perspective. So I, I just wanna say that I appreciate how technology and science is filling in some of those lost chapters and how they're confirming the very old histories that there are native friends have long been saying. They're saying in a pe perhaps more mythopoetic language, but the data is there. Mm -hmm. That's true. I appreciate the daring scientists who are willing to go where that evidence leads them. I appreciate when they sit down with us, a lay audience, to add their piece to the grand puzzle and to help us build out and expand our worldview. Because we must ask these questions. We must push the boundaries of what is known and accepted. And we must look at this first unearthing of the new data while it's still fresh and contested and controversial. That's where it's always exciting. And that's where the aha experiences live. Yeah. And we're sure to have a few today. We need to hear the evidence. We need to ask the questions. And uh, we need to celebrate those scientists who are willing to sit down with us and share it with us, the lay audience. So let us introduce... Yuri Kletchula today. Yeah. He's an archaeologist, he's a geologist, he's a climatologist. He's one who can truly uh, decode that land bridge for us in all of its many uh, eras. And he joins us from Poland, where he's um, a member of the Adam Mackiewicz University there. And um, he has spent extensive time in Siberia and northern Canada. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the evidence, looking at the early sites, looking at the climate and all the evidence for uh, what it what it has to tell us. This is, Welcome, Yuri. Well, hello. Hi from, <laughs> hi from Central Europe, from Poland now. Yes, well, welcome. I'm yeah. so happy to have you, you here. This is really exciting because you, you combine two professions that yeah. make so much sense to take the field of archaeology and geology and put them together and see where it can take us. I mean, this is groundbreaking. And yet it seems like common sense, maybe more archaeologists need to become geologists and more geologists need to become <laughs> archaeologists. Need more yeah, disciplinary that conversations, sense. that's for sure. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, so I just wanna say the land bridge, um, it has long been a barrier. This is what Paulette Steves is gonna tell us, the colonial attitude that we're, we native people are recent arrivals and therefore this was manifest destiny for you Westerners to come over from Europe and, and just populate the land and push us aside. You know, we're gonna hear that perspective, but this land bridge, yeah, it's, it's a bridge between these two continents, but also this attitude that it was only ice free and uh, above ground during the end of the ice age has rather been a barrier paradoxically. But you're one of many scientists saying we find evidence of early peopling of the Americas. 
you're finding evidence going back 30 and 40,000 years. Scanty evidence, circumspective evidence, but mm -hmm. evidence. So you have a lot to share with us today. Tell us how this even became your quest. Why? Why are you on this track? Well, um, it's a quite a, already a long story because I started to be um, interested in uh, Paleolithic investigations already in Europe um, in the late 1990s, yeah. And um, having studied uh, many Paleolithic collections from Upper Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic, as well as Early Paleolithic from Europe, from, uh, from uh, North Africa. So I uh, became more uh, like uh, interested uh, in the intriguing question about the antiquity of the old world. Yeah. And uh, Charlie, you mentioned uh, my double specialization because I have, I'm a quaternary geologist, census stricto, as well as I'm archaeologist, have two PhD degrees, both of them. Um, uh, I completed my studies in Alberta in Canada, a PhD in uh, archaeology in Calgary, and PhD in earth and atmospheric sciences in Edmonton. Wow. And uh, uh, actually, uh, from necessity, um, I became a geologist uh, in order to prove the antiquity of the early sites that I discovered by chance uh, um, in the outskirts of the city of Calgary mm -hmm. in 1991, when I was a PhD student there at the Department of Archaeology. So, uh, well... Well, what led um, you to those sites that you discovered? <laughs> Well, actually, the sites were discovered really by chance, yeah, because I I was living in the western part of the city, and um, along the Bow River, in the Ward City Park, City Park, there are very nice exposures, and because uh, I studied previously, or I was accustomed to visit to search, I mean, such kind of locations, geomorphic natural geomorphic locations. Okay. So one day I make a walk um, uh, along the erosions and uh, started to pick up uh, in the middle part of the section, which is uh, from the upper, from top, is covered by grass, but in the lower part is exposed. Yeah? So the cliffs are close to a vertical. So the section is quite well accessible. And I started to pick up uh, lithic items mm -hmm. that uh, reminded me right away to uh, stone tools, uh, definite stone tools that I uh, studied previously in Europe, yeah? in, uh, in, in, uh, in Czechoslovakia, in the Musée de l'Homme in Paris, yeah? and in other places, in, in, in Germany, etc. And- uh, You knew what they was... looked like. You knew what you had because you'd seen yeah. them not contested you'd seen old world stone tools you're looking at something going oh i know this this is yeah, the same well, i was i was i mean it was it was very surprising because at that at that point i had uh, very little knowledge about the antiquity of the prairies indeed prior to my arrival to canada uh, why i i kept uh, i was in touch with a um, uh, professor in archaeology and cultural anthropology or an anthropology department at edmonton Alan Bryan, uh, with whom we eventually established quite a, a fruitful collaboration in the coming years. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, at the point of my, I mean, discovery, um, uh, uh, my my knowledge about the antiquity of the surrounding area was um, rather minor. I must accept, yeah, and um, I admit. Um, when I when I brought uh, the material about. Um, the human um, authenticity had no, 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 no questions. Yeah, I was definitely sure what I'm having in hand. I brought it to the department in Calgary or to my department and um, and presented a collection uh, that I collected um, within a couple of weeks to my colleagues and to local professors. And well, uh, I was thought, okay, well, this is just the ordinary. 
uh, lithic industry of uh, of local Palo Indians, so the Holocene cultures, and uh, there are many hundreds or perhaps possibly thousands of sites uh, distributed across the prairies, which uh, are characterized by the same kind of lithic instruments. So, so called like uh, pebble tool industry, uh, chopper, some, uh, some uh, rudimentary knives, flakes, hammer stones, yeah, mm -hmm. scrapers, retouched. Yeah. So I said, okay, but uh, this is from a context. Uh, Underneath Glacier Lake Calgary deposits, mm -hmm. uh, it means uh, about uh, 25 meters below the present surface. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we know that Glacier Lake Calgary is more or less uh, correlated with the last glacial maximum in Western Canada when the ice slope from the north expanded to the southern prairies mm -hmm. and then the river, the Bow River, to create the lake. So mm -hmm. it means that the lithic industry must be uh, older. Early, must be older than yeah. the lake, the existence of the lake. Mm -hmm. So when I when I told them about the context, so immediate reaction was okay. Well, in this case, uh, these uh, cannot be stone tools because they would be too old. Yeah, mm -hmm. they would be earlier than, than, than this twelve thousand years. What is now the maximum age? Of people in of the Western Canadian prairies, yeah, and uh, therefore, I mean, they would not fit in the present scenario. Therefore, uh, they cannot be stone tools. Yeah. Not. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So you knew what stone tools look like. That's how I wanted to jump in on that yeah. because maybe it took someone coming from Europe without the prejudice that maybe North American archaeologists had just accustomed themselves to, to, to see something in plain sight. I mean, you're saying that this was in plain sight. This was not deeply hidden, the, the, your, your first finds. It was right there. And yet, you know... Nobody's I'm, looking 25 feet down because they don't exactly. expect to find yeah. anything. Yeah, they don't expect to right? find it. We had can't, that, that prejudice of, of like, it doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah. And so when you do find stone tools, you will be showing us slides of these. So we'll get to see yeah, yeah. and compare. Mm -hmm. You're going to show us this. But, yes, later on, sure. Sure. Yeah, a little bit later on. But just to put this all into context, this motivated you to do what? You said, I need well, to prove my case. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, uh, upon enrol en en enrollment in my archaeology program in Calgary, so I uh, first decided to continue in my former mm -hmm. studies from Central Europe on okay. the Neanderthal culture. So my my uh, presumed uh, or planned uh, PhD thesis was about the Middle Paleolithic of the cave sites in Central Moravia, in Moravian Karst, which mm -hmm. is quite famous and very rich in cave sites from the Middle to uh, Upper Paleolithic as well as to Mesolithic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but um, uh, somehow, in the course of discussion and meetings, I was the only European and the rest of the master and PhD students, very good colleagues and friends at the time, um, were from United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. And their primary uh, education and the previous program, university program, was in uh, anthropology, yeah? mm -hmm. so uh, cultural anthropology. And uh, all the discussions about the antiquity of the old world uh, were just around, uh, I mean, coming around uh, this topic. And uh, to me, uh, it was a little bit strange because um, well, um, it was on the limits of science fiction, as I, as I, as this was my perception at the, at the very moment. Yeah, and uh, yes. as I was pushed to provide interpretation of uh, these collections from Moravia in the same way as uh, Binford School proclaimed in the 80s and 90s. So it was just um, in, I mean, this kind of reasoning. So um, So you're saying just, that the same reasoning that you apply to Moravia in Europe with these old stone tools, 
No problem. Accepted. Yeah, of it would course. be no problem. Yeah, you know, people were there in the Ice Age. But yeah, the no, same no, argument no. you apply to tools in Canada, oh my God, no, it can't be. It's, it's a bit different, yeah. But I would, just, yeah. I would just explain it. I mean, first I decided to write my thesis, my, uh, my PhD thesis about the Middle Paleolithic, but uh, it would be from the Northern American uh, perspective of culture anthropology. And I dislike this idea because we had just hard data, materials, some scrapers, geological context, and you cannot um, uh, you cannot make any stories yeah, about the relations between man and woman, and and even about seasonality. Yeah. So therefore, I I I, uh, I dropped my already finished thesis that I wrote, huh. and uh, I was enraptured. I was very. Uh, taken up by the new discovery that I did in Calgary, yeah, mm -hmm. because I saw very nice geological context, uh, which was quite straightforward, yeah, and definite lithic collections, which uh, uh, expanded by every visit of mine, yeah, and also I performed some excavations, but I will explain this or comment on this later on. And uh, from this reason, I say, I, I said, I have very nice, to very nice topic, but in order to to make a hard case, I decided to go uh, to enroll simultaneously into a PhD program in quaternary geology in Edmonton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was studying. Um, I was yes, I was studying two PhD degrees within yeah six five years. Yeah. So and. Uh, <laughs> Um, this eventually helped me to defend this mm -hmm. Calgary um, localities, my findings uh, mm -hmm. in 1995, yeah, um, in front of a committee, which was, uh, uh -huh. um, I mean, there were people from United States, from Canada, even some external European archaeologists and geologists, and it was, it was fine, but at the very point, I was a little bit like, okay, don't write about it. The topic is too controversial. Yeah, so you have to <laughs> make a little bit. I mean, to choose another topic. Yeah, but I to my, think about. yeah, I I was a little bit stubborn and personally convinced. So mm -hmm. I stayed, and I'm very happy about it. Yeah, so it okay. was the beginning of my research in Canada. Well, let's just say something about how important that geological situation was to find the debris of a glacier that scrapes along the land when these glaciers are a mile thick and picks up all the rock, moves it around and then drops it, right? Yeah. That, it's not like you can say, oh, that artifact just an animal dug a hole and that artifact fell down and now it's at a lower strata. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have these same arguments. You, you, well, I mean, that's pretty much, yeah, that's the date. Right? There's an event no. that happened, drop this material on it. Or what were some of the objections? Well, it was the primary objection was that all of these are geofacts. Yeah. So uh, that, I, that geology I, made these, not humankind, that the big yeah. so of all of the pressure. All of the, yeah. yeah. Because of this uh, very extraordinary nature of the context of these archaeological or cultural findings. Yeah. yeah. So the extraordinary objection, claims need extraordinary evidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the the objection was okay. So these cannot be stone tools, regardless of, of the fact that they are identical with the collections from on top on the surface, which are very well dated and they belong to the Paleo Indian cultures or even to uh, uh, they continue to early historical times. Yeah, in the same uh, in the same shapes. Yeah, in the same. Uh, characteristics as Expedian industry. And uh, the argument was that I remember for one conference until now that uh, um, a glacier acts as a bulldozer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everything is simply being crushed on the way. Yeah. And uh, uh, so okay. in the masses of, of material, in the bulk mm -hmm. of material, you mm -hmm. can select something which may resemble. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, mimic um, uh, human, humanly produced tools, stone tools, yeah. Is, but is, that, really... is that a reasonable argument? Because you do have extraordinary pressures and you have rock against rock and you have the weight. And, um, so, I mean, they're saying these stone tools may look like the similar to the Paleolithic 
tools that you found in the old world, the Ice Age tools, but it could be that yeah, extreme you're saying, geological conditions produce them. What was your response to that? Yeah, you see, uh, the arguments are very, very, very short-sighted. They were just taken out of context, yeah, uh, by and presented by people who had no experience about uh, lithic flaking, flaking, yeah, no experimental flaking, uh, no knowledge about uh, about uh, how uh, really glacial advances, what are the resulting uh, geomorphic and geological geomorphic forms and uh, geological faces, yeah, and. Uh, uh, it was, um, I mean, I, I presented in my thesis. Uh, uh, a collection or a sequence of um, of attributes, yeah, which are uh, definite human, yeah, and by these are attributes of, that only human yeah, can employ yeah. on a stone, yeah, and by combination, yeah. yeah, and by combination of these attributes, you get even a stronger case. So you make even combination of combination of the of the attributes. You understand, yeah. So perhaps one can be can be can be produced in a different environment, like. If you have a cobble from a good, like silicious rock, good, I mean, rock which can produce some conchoidal fractures, okay. then it falls down from the waterfall. Yeah. So it can create some damage which may resemble mm -hmm. uh, some edge uh, like of uh, on, a myelitis. Yeah. Yeah. But the, but the, but the, but the thing is that we had no waterfalls. Yeah. There. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, I mean, we have to make, uh, we have to stay in uh, in argumentation, just uh, going from the very context. And if you perceive the glacier uh, ex expanding, yeah, so it it uh, it crushes some rocks. But we are about 120, 150 kilometers away from the Rocky Mountains, yeah, on the plains. So the ice. Uh, was already moving and expanding in the former river valley. So basically rolling rolled materials, no sharp debris, yeah, like in the upper reaches where the rocks fall down from the cliffs. Yeah. So all, all the rocks were very nicely uh, rolled and smooth. Yet, and in between, uh, in a very discrete unit, not everywhere, just at the base. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the of the tail, which means the material mm -hmm. uh, expanded or laid down by the ice, we have this uh, mm -hmm. this uh, very uh, differently looking collections of lithics, yeah, mm -hmm. which are hundred percent identical with the lithics than we have from not just from the old world but also from the prehistoric North American cultures, yeah. Would and, the size also be a factor so that they were the size well, it, held uh, in the hand, they weren't too big, I, as, they weren't too small, okay. so that would be yeah. an indication. Yeah. 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 As I can show you on my presentation, so they are from small scrapers up to mm -hmm. like uh, 15 centimeters large bifaces. Yeah. And, uh, oh, bifaces. The best, yeah. yeah, very handy material and the best uh, uh, a specimen, yeah, the most proven specimen confirming in situ location, yeah, uh, of the of the archaeological record is a biface, uh, nicely uh, flaked on both sides, yeah, and in the nearby two square meters, I collected in very controlled archaeological excavations, eighteen of the single flakes. That can be put back to the original cobble. Yeah. So imagine uh, again back, you, you go to, to the ice, yeah, and the bulldozing, yeah, uh, assumption. Uh, there would be no way, not, uh, I mean, it's absolutely impossible that you would have uh, a humanly looking uh, item, yeah. Still, with uh, in clay, yeah, on the on the clay surface, uh, distributed the detached flakes, yeah, and everything stays stays in situ, yeah. So you would have to stop the ice at one sign in one place. So simply, okay, uh, no more, no more expansion, etc. So it's it's uh, 
uh, well, generally, this argumentation is very short sighted and just shows a lack of understanding. So it's very cheap, cheap argumentation. And, uh, and, and uh, archaeologists, um, uh, as, as me or any other, any other uh, uh, like um, discoveries, uh, uh, showing us uh, at least suggesting some uh, pre Clovis. Uh, occupation are being questioned, yeah, without any any grounds. So this is not a science; it's just a one plain talking. Yeah, I think it's important for both sides to ask the questions. I think those questions are very important. But what I heard you say, I just want to clarify this: Do you said that you found the complete stone that had been napped, all the debris pieces? as yeah. well as the point, you found the entire thing. That is intelligently struck to get those particular edges right, and shape. Yeah. I mean, that really shows human ingenuity. That would be hard to say that Ice Age some, some natural, forces of right, geology right, right, right. There's no natural way for it so to cleverly happen. just happened to strike stones in a way to create a point. I mean that would be a hard argument to persist. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you if you say well this is no side, then you would have to uh, uh, discard uh, uh, all sides or the majority, ninety nine percent of all Paleolithic sites across across the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I see. So if you apply it to you have to you cannot have a double standard, is what you're yeah, saying. Exactly. If you apply this it is here, a, yeah. you yeah. must apply it there. And yes, conversely, yes. if you apply, this is what a lithic tool looks like by made by human hands here, you see the evidence here, you have to say, we have to look at yeah. it seriously. Yeah. And it's still you have to take listen. into consideration the context. So most of these arguments yeah. uh, have been presented as I already said by, by culture anthropologists, yeah? but uh, without having any background in geology. yeah. And the geology actually, by when I when I organized uh, uh, international meeting as a site uh, after my defense, my doctoral defense, then uh, geology said, okay, well, the geological context and the interpretation is correct, yeah, but we cannot say anything about the lithics, yeah, because we are not the experts. And the archaeologist said, okay, the lithics look okay, yeah, but. Uh, we are hesitant to express ourselves about the context because we don't have the background. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so it was just a, myself, yeah, who could make argumentation and uh, provide some proofs and reasoning to both sides. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. it's a good thing you had that those dual PhDs. Yeah. So uh, it I would just, be uh, nice. It would be nice I, if you found a bug just, uh, with the okay, point. Sorry, I just uh, Laura, I just stopped for a minute. I have to close the shield in the window. Okay. Oh yes, yeah. close the blinds. So okay. if you all right, so I'm I'm ready to continue. Sorry about it, but we have no, just the no. uh, distant sun, yeah, the sun uh, sunset and it's uh, shining yeah. in my eye. Sunset in Poland. It's the first time I've had a, a Poland yes, sunset. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I guess we, what we were saying is that it would be nice to find a bone with a point in it, with cut marks in it, with a little further evidence. Do you think it exists there? You just have yet to find it. But the chances are rather slim when nobody's looking at that level. Yeah, nobody's looking. And uh, to my uh, surprise, uh, uh, to my surprise, uh, after 30 years, uh, to my to my knowledge, nobody continued in the in the research that I started. Yeah, even I mean independently, just uh, uh, taken into account or thinking about some of these uh, principles. I mean, it's very, very, very easy and very logical. If mm -hmm. you want to find uh, some older material, archaeological material, you have to look into old geological deposits. Yeah. Right. Uh, you cannot find it in uh, in more recent uh, stuff, yeah, um, mm -hmm. and uh, basically practice the same kind of approach and um, methodological strategies as we do in the old world. Uh, yes. uh, no matter, I mean, there are many many excellent uh, American uh, uh, archaeologists working in a Paleolithic studies in Africa, in uh, in uh, in Europe. In, uh, in Asia, including Siberia. And uh, 
I just wonder why the same approach cannot be applied in uh, on the American continent by by the U.S. or Canadian Canadian archaeologists. Yeah, so this is this is quite quite strange. Yeah, and as I said. Uh, we plan to continue in the research uh, re to reinitiate re re investigations this year yeah. because we have to stop it uh, due to pandemic and, and all these restrictions. But um, sure. now um, travels to Russia are more, com more, more complicated. So it right. will be mm -hmm. our, our uh, I understand even sending today. an email to yes. your Russian colleagues is complicated. Okay, so yeah. I have a question. So the Ice Age lasts about 100,000 years our interstitial warming period between ice ages, although we probably have disrupted and maybe the age of ice ages is over, I don't know. But um, that's only what, 10 or 12 or maybe 15,000 years. So we spend a lot more time in an ice age than we do in our current warming period. Interesting. But you're saying if you dial back the land bridge and Calgary, what is now Northern Canada, Alaska, that part of the world. If you dial it back um, 30, 40,000 years, whatever date you assign your finds, wasn't that still covered in ice? That was an ice age. The glacial maximum, the height of the ice age was only what, 19,000 years to 20,000 years. So you're saying this was before the ice age was at its most fierce, its, its coldest. What was yeah. the climate like when you believe that humans were there in Calgary, what is now Calgary, and creating these artifacts that you found, these lithics, Good question. And these stone tools? Tell yeah. us about the, you're a geologist, you looked at the climate. Please describe the climate from Siberia to the land bridge to the, the northern North American continent, because we have been thinking solid block of ice. That doesn't seem to be the case. There's no, no definitely, now. Yeah, yeah. Def, you are absolutely right. This was definitely not the case because, um, uh, well, first about uh, uh, periodization. So we are talking about late Pleistocene. So late Pleistocene, we have last interglacial 130,000 to about uh, 74,000 years. Yeah, uh, And from 74,000 years, we have Last glacial, yeah. Lois, to, oh, L O E S S. What is yes. the, find the term? Yeah, so up to 12,000 years. But uh, the last glacial is uh, includes early last glacial from about 74 to 60,000 years, okay. yeah, which uh, was characterized in East Siberia as well as in. Uh, in the adjoining part of uh, of the American continent by very cold and dry climate. Okay. And uh, it was more or less the same case uh, during the late last glacial that you call in in US late uh, Wisconsin. Yeah. So early Wisconsin and late Wisconsin. Yeah. Late Wisconsin 24 to 12, let's say. I'm not yeah. hearing the term. What is the term that you're using? Late Late. Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Oh, Wisconsin. Okay, oh, yeah. that's an era, the Wisconsin. Yeah. Got it. And, but in between the two, we had two, two glacial stages. Yeah, mm -hmm. We had very long uh, period of inter, uh, uh, interstadial, mid-Wisconsin mm -hmm. interstadial, yeah? mm -hmm. which corresponds which to me, me, I me IS marine isotope stage three from 55 to about 24,000 years. Okay. The climate wow. at the time, um, now we're talking about Eastern Siberia uh, as well as, um, uh, let's say Alaska or Western Canada was cooler. Yeah? In some places it was more humid, but also in some places like in Siberia was warmer than today. Yeah? Warmer than today. Warmer than, warmer than today. Uh, I mean, in East wow. Siberia, uh, we had uh, a record, uh, paleo, a palynological record, it means pollen from fossil plants, right. which presumes a climate by two degrees warmer than today. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. So this, uh, the climate is really fluctuating. Climate it was very, it was ride. extremely, right. It yeah. was extremely fluctuating, especially during this mid 
during, during this uh, interstadial yeah, period, which uh, uh, so lasted, estrogens don't really last hundred thousand years. Yeah, I mean this they really don't. Yeah, this interstadial period lasted for about 30, 35,000 years. So this was quite a long time. Yeah. Right. Yet the land bridge between the two continents, between uh, the Chukotka, the present day Chukotka in Alaska, was connected most of the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. There was enough connected. ice to take up the water levels. So this land was, yeah. was uh, and, uh, exposed. And, right. Yeah. And the biota, yeah, were quite quite favorable. Yeah, the climate was moderate. Yeah, there was no ice built. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, in the area between the present uh, eastern Siberia and Alaska, that would create some kind of physical barrier. So this was not the case. So the you're saying thirty for thirty five thousand years, we yes. have a land bridge with no ice. Exactly. It was and not that was fifty five thousand years ago to twenty four thousand years ago yes. when the glacial the, maximum came. So then the ice started to accumulate there. Just but you had exactly. a wide open corridor that nobody has really recognized till recently when the evidence came in that this was a highway between these two continents. Ultra, you had mastodons, you had flora, you had yeah. step conditions. Why not humans and yeah. no well, ice? So the animals um, came through. The humans, of course, would be following the animals. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're saying it was I mean, a two-way street of exchange. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And as you, 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 you said it quite explicitly. I mean, where are the big animals? There must have been humans. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, that's what we do. We follow the animals. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Hunting. Yeah, or scavenging. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the adaptation is uh, not important now. Yeah, uh, the the key point is that there was no physical barrier. There was no no open open sea. There was no big chunk of ice. Yeah, that uh, the early people would have to go through. Yeah, or across. Yeah, and uh, we have very solid accumulating evidence for early people in in eastern Siberia just as close as to 1500 kilometers to the present Bering state. Yeah. And we have sites which are dated up to 47,000 years. Mm. Yeah. So you imagine you have seven, almost 50,000 years old, right when this was happening, right, right. when it was Forces possible and had the conditions. Yeah. You, had, and, uh, you had sites all the way through. Yeah. And we have there's the sites that are they are patterned. They are found in one geomorphic position, as I will show on my final presentation, closing this, uh, our, our talk today. And yes. uh, uh, I mean, the sites are also very, uh, I mean, they are rich uh, of uh, paleontological remains, yep. mammoths, rhinoceros, horse, etc. So all this megafauna, which was the same as in North America, the same kind of plants, yeah. So it was uh, parkland or dry, uh, well, in the coldest uh, oscillations, it was tundra, but most of the time it was it was taiga, or taiga, uh, taiga step or forest step. Yeah, so very the taiga mosaic. step, the tundra. It all supported the mastodons. Yes, the very mosaic environment Beautiful. and wow. very biotically very very rich environment. Yeah, wow. and therefore, I mean, uh, to me, when you when you imagine a continent. Actually, two continents which are connected together, there is no barrier. And so there was no way how not to perceive uh, simply the, the expansion, the spread of people following in a natural way the megafauna on the present North American continent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. at, uh, at the latest, during the mid Wisconsin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So during this time spent between 50 and 20 or so thousand years. Yeah, and the ice, and then at the time in North Canada or in Western Canada, there were uh, no glaciers. I mean, connected glaciers that would uh, uh, make some obstacle, you know, create some obstacle to people to go far the south along the foothills, you know, or or along the along the along the sea coast. Again, yeah. so and these uh, from this uh, time horizon. We have a series of these early sites that we uncovered in Calgary, 
uh, not just in Calgary, but in other sites, in other valleys, in Alberta, in Western Canada. Yeah. And the uh, ice free corridor, it just refers to the uh, deglaciating phase when the glaciers, the uh, lobe, ice slope from the north and the uh, uh, glaciers expanding from the Rocky Mountains joined at a certain point. But again, these were limited in uh, Western Canada just to the Athabasca area. Yeah? And the rest was ice free. But this was the hard last glacial maximum much later. Yeah, mm -hmm. it could have been several tens, thousands of years later when yeah. the first immigrants yeah. already came and the people yeah. were just mm -hmm. south of the ah. connecting ice. Yeah, and yeah. the ice free corridor just refers to the time spent of the final deglaciation of the warming. Yeah, the final Pleistocene warming. Yeah, so when they became disconnected at the end of the Pleistocene. Yes, but again, mm -hmm. and there may have been a new wave. Yeah. Again, oh, of course, there'd be a wave, yeah. 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 But this was not migrations. the first one. This yeah. was not the first one. I mean, this is this is mm -hmm. for sure, yeah. So, you, you know, I really appreciate the, the means, the motive, the opportunity. You laid right? the foundation. You had the means. You had yeah. this ice-free corridor 50,000 years ago. You had the opportunity. Hey, right. we're going to follow the animals. They're there. And uh, the motive, oh my gosh, let's, we're, we're migratory species. This has been incredible to be able to lay the foundation for the yeah. discussion. So we knew where we were gonna go with this. Yeah. And the evidence is just so compelling. I'm looking forward to the slideshow now. That well, we well one to... last question before okay. the slideshow. So when the waters now submerge, the ice melts, goes into the ocean, the ocean levels are rising by a hundred meters. I mean, a lot, right? Mm -hmm. It's right. submerging the ground that you would also expect to find these campsites, the habitation, the villages, the whatever. I asked you before, was it like, how long would it take for somebody to traverse? I'm in Siberia, I wanna to go to Alaska. You said about a year, but these people were probably setting up homesteads and populating. They were traveling with babies and children and stuff and all of this. It's not like they're racing to get from one end to the other. There, it's a beautiful, it's about the size of Australia, this land bridge, when it was the most exposed, right? And right. ice free. This was a continent unto itself, just about. Well, People would settle pretty, there. Yeah. They would settle where there's water. They would settle on those coasts. They, now that's submerged, if you want to go find their evidence, you've got to be a deep sea diver to go find it, right? Yeah. And then, right. and then, I mean, I, okay, so I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. You go to Eastern Washington and you see the Badlands, the Scablands, they call mm. it. You see where the ice dam, when the ice ages was melting. Right, scraped. Flood the area and mm. just like take it all away. Right. So that not only did the ice scrape the ground of all this evidence, but the waters melting did, mm -hmm. at least in Eastern Washington, famous for that. Yeah. It took geologists quite a while to recognize the force of the water um, melting. And then when it finally let go, my God, just scrape everything away. So, um, so there's a lot of evidence has been lost or it's not accessible, but this tantalizing evidence and multiple migrations, you find Monte Verde in Chile, you find DNA of the Jomon from Japan. Mm -hmm. You find it from the Polynesians. If they could navigate the oceans and find Hawaii, they could certainly bump into a continent, right? Early on with boats. These were skilled navigators. Yeah. So yes, multiple migrations. You've got the Olmec, who knows who they were. You've got, look, looks like Chinese and African. You've got, I mean, we're such a melting pot and so early on. But the exciting thing to me is, again, we're one family. Yeah, I mean, that's the argument. And, and we've got a shared story here. We need to yeah. reclaim our familial roots here. You are, you are, you are right. That many of these, I mean, if you take it into consideration, the route along the coast, that the majority of these early sites um, are now submerged. Yeah, uh, Perhaps only the sites which were located farther up, yeah, several mm -hmm. tens of meters, so maybe may be found, but uh, the chances uh, to locate early sites, the best ones are in the 
I mean, we take uh, into consideration uh, the interior route. Yeah, so the chances uh -huh. are very high. Yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, 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 in a, at the most of the sites that we investigated, uh, there was no bulldozing. Yeah, so uh, simply very comfortably in a in a undisturbed way, uh, we have masses of the till. Uh, sometimes the till is clay, so there are no rocks. It depends on the previous mm -hmm. the till uh, the, uh, the, of the, the deposits. Yeah. So yeah. all these, all the till of this, all this uh, clay of this mass, mm -hmm. uh, ice mass or ice derived uh, uh, material Every, was, yeah. was blanketed in, yeah, uh, uh. in a in a uh, just part partly erosional way, not absolutely erosional way. The prairies, yeah. So uh, in many, many, many places, as I will also show you just in a while, we have paleontological sites which are very nice preserved. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, uh, buried forest also underneath the glacial tail. Yeah. Which shows you what the climate was. Yeah. yeah. So we have the idea what was there about the climate, but mm -hmm. what we found are these biotic uh, remains. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it was not like everything was scratched away, yeah, to the right. bedrock, which is, right. by the way, is soft. It's not the rocky bedrock, yeah, mm -hmm. so. So the ice didn't scrape everything away, just in just in parts. Yeah, yeah. just a part or just uh, mm -hmm. really just a few meters perhaps, yeah, but mm -hmm. let behind uh, 20, 30, 50 meters uh, uh, sections, yeah, so. Right. Uh, right. It's a very nuanced story. There's yeah, been many yeah. shades of gray here, just like life. Yeah. You yeah. can't just blanket it with one brush stroke. Yeah. All right. I would I would okay. go ahead with my, with my presentation. Slideshow. Yeah. Good. And uh, all right. So yeah, the talk uh, which we were uh, running until now is summarized in this uh, short presentation about that I entitled Paleolithic People, People of Beringia. And the reason of Beringia is because I'm working in Siberia and previously I was working in Canada and want to reinitiate my investigations there, just closing the gap in a sort, yeah. Um, now the outline, well, we were talking already with, with you, Laura and Paul about the mid Wisconsin environments and the cultural evidence that we uncovered uh, in the uh, Russian Eastern Arctic, yeah, which dates 50 to 24,000 years from now, yeah, which uh, corresponds to this interstadial, very mod moderate, sometimes warmer climate than today and very favorable, favorable environmental conditions. Uh, the same is true about the late Pleistocene geography and paleoecology, when, again, I repeat, there was no physical barrier during this time span, which would block people to go from one continent, the present continent, or even vice versa at certain time following migratory routes of megafauna. Uh, few pictures about glacial context of archaeological, or glaciogenic context of archaeological sites. Glaciogenic, it means uh, uh, formations, geological deposits, which were uh, accumulated, which have certain linkage to uh, to environments uh, of uh, ice fields or valley ice or continental ice. Yeah, and the final point is that we have a definite evidence for pre-last glacial, so earlier than twenty-four thousand years old people in of the Northern America. Uh, which already discredited uh, these three decades ago, the Clovis first story that was established already 100 years ago in the 1920s um, <clears throat> to, my, uh, to my memory, <laughs> to my reasoning, yeah? Okay, so this first map <clears throat> shows the present day um, uh, distribution of Paleolithic sites, which are pre, uh, upper Paleolithic. So these are middle Paleolithic sites. Uh, Mamontova Curia site is located in the polar Urals, Urals mountains, 
it's open air site and it was dated from very nice uh, uh, geological section including uh, biotic uh, remains dated to about 40,000 years and it was interpreted as uh, occupation sites possibly associated with Neanderthals yeah and why with Neanderthals the first humans the homo sapiens sapiens they appeared in uh, in this kind in, in this in this area of, of uh, eastern Europe much later so we have these very famous Baltic sites as Kostyanki also um, um, message in the present Ukraine yeah and uh, there is a theory that the expansion of these uh, new people more than people homo sapiens sapiens um, uh, uh, pushed the origin the previous neanderthal population farther north yeah to the arctic area so therefore we have the interpretation of mamontova Korea as a neanderthal site the same is true about our site then we uncovered uh, about uh, yeah it will be four years ago uh, uh, in uh, in the north northern part of Western Siberia near uh, the town Tazov, yeah, uh, close to the Arctic coast, and we have uh, again uh, a very nice artifact buried in as a cobble in a, in a pit, yeah, uh, where uh, geologically it should not be, yeah, no way if uh, if uh, if uh, humanly worked or even in if natural yeah so it is in peat and uh, below below the peat and above we have fossil soils uh the peat was dated more than uh 40 000 years yeah so again we have some indices about early human occupation then we go farther east we have a site a potential site on Taimir peninsula in north in northern siberia North Central Siberia, where we have mammoth remains with alleged uh, cut marks. Yeah, cut marks produced by humans, like scratching the meat. Or, but uh, the evidence is not definite, but it may be. Yeah. Uh, another site, Unigan. So we are already approaching our census strict uh, area of investigations. Uh, the site is located on the Yana River. I will show a few slides from there. And we have quite a large collection of uh, uh, bone tools, so bone artifacts made on um, osteological materials of uh, megafauna on uh, mammoth, mammoth ivory, uh, rhinoceros bones, uh, uh, horse bones, etc. And uh, from this site is also uh, a finding of a wolf bone, which was perforated. And the interpretation is that uh, the perforation was a result of trauma uh, provided by early people uh, while hunting the, the beast. Yeah? Uh, next site we have uh, Badaricha. This is on um, on Indigirka River. Again, the same situation, the same context, the same fauna, the same archaeology, uh, bone tools, uh, few stone tools in very good context. Dates about forty five thousand years. And the most unique are the site on Kolyma River, Irlach Siena and Zirianka. Zirianka delivered so far the earliest dates on a, on a set. Actually, this was one artifact dated up to well close to fifty thousand years, calibrated, and the other pieces that I will show. So they are dated up to uh, well, about from forty four to to fifty. Yeah. So we are very close to the Beringland Bridge, and we are all the sites are around the Arctic Circle or beyond the Arctic Circle. So this would suggest some kind of uh, uh, uniformity of environment, but also uniformity of people in, uh, potential Neanderthal people in, but definitely 
pre-modern, pre-sapiens, sapiens, people, yeah, having the same, same, same kind of environmental adaptation. Yeah. So now uh, for understanding yeah, what we were talking about uh, until now about the Eastern Siberia, the present limits are here and Alaska over there. Yeah. So during the mid Wisconsin, uh, 55 to about 24,000 years, yeah. And later, actually up to 12,000 years, so we have the land bridge was expanding to the maximum extent to here and was a little bit narrowing, but still existing during the warmer oscillations during the interstadial. So even if the land bridge was not so uh, broad, yeah, let's say during the interstadial optimum, which was about 45,000 years till now, the solid land existed and connected both continents. Yeah? And from this very period, 40 to 50, we have the majority of early sites in the Arctic Siberia. So therefore, there is no reason simply to abolish or to, uh, to drop the, uh, the, the notion that people could have migrated farther uh, onto the present America. Yeah. The East Siberian Paleolithic studies, they are very uh, interdisciplinary. And this is what we started our present talk with. Um, so I'm quaternary geologist and, and as well as archeologist. And uh, uh, you have to have certain grasp of all sciences that are involved in this, uh, in this mosaic of, uh, of, uh, of research. So not just uh, quaternary geology, yeah. Uh, previously, I was uh, studying less palosol deposits in southern Siberia, and therefore thick sections which have 30, 40 meters. Uh, they simply don't discourage me to have a look into these for archaeological materials, as we have early sites in uh, in Central Asia, in uh, in northern China, uh, in Eastern Europe, which are very deeply buried. So the same approach as I already outlined at the beginning. Chronostratigraphy, geoarchaeology, paleontology, taphonomy of uh, paleontological remains and occurrences, paleoecology, it means reconstruction of the past environments from biotic data that we retrieve from these ancient formations, either unfrozen or frozen. And in the frozen state, we, found, we find most of the early sites now in Eastern Siberia because the territory is underlined by solid permafrost. And use via analysis of lithic tools and, and bone items. Now, the environmental change, um, um, as, I, as I already said, uh, the climate was moderate. Um, the biotic or environmental conditions were unique for people, for, for dispersal, because these uh, these. Uh, uh, human groups were a part of a, a late Pleistocene mammal community. So, where are the big mammoths, the big, big mammals, mammals, rhinoceros, horses, bisons? There are very also people. And uh, the focus is on the Creolithic formations. Yeah? And the time focus already dating, uh, encompassing the, the entire late Pleistocene from 130 to about 12,000 years from now. Yeah. Uh, about the climate change, the present climate change or the, the territory of Eastern Siberia is subject of, 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 of uh, increase in warming. So global warming, the same trend, yeah. But it's not just the warming, it's the increase of, of um, extremality. So we have colder winters, yeah. As last winter in Yakutsk went down to minus 65 degrees, but also we have summers which, uh, are, which reach up to 40 degrees plus Celsius. Yeah. And uh, when we uh, make a statistical analysis from uh, about a dozen of meteor stations across Yakutian or Yakutia, the Republic of Sakha, which is the equivalent term, so we see um, 
varmint trend from about minus 10 to minus seven and a half yeah, during the last 40 years. And this warming trend uh, help us to get a better access to paleontological and archeological sites, which used to be deeply frozen still several years ago. And these sites are largely located along eroding riverbanks, yeah, which we uh, search through. Yeah. So, uh, any comment till now, Laura, Paul? Yes, actually I do. So the surprise is how rapidly climates can change. And I understand that the Arctic is warming today faster than the rest of the world. So I think we need to come to grips with how fast climate can change. And I think you're demonstrating evidence of that historically, aren't you? Yeah, but this is just an auxiliary like um, kind of um, investigations. Yeah, but uh, it is in the complex of the of the studies that we uh, um, perform uh, in this part of Siberia. Now, on this map, I mean, this is a this is a northern not uh, eastern part of the Sakha Republic of Yakutia. Uh, we have three uh, places uh, for three regions of investigations. First, delimiting the center uh, drainage system of Yana River. The second the central part of uh, Indigirka and the uh, yellow one is upper and center Kolyma. So these are the principal regions of our studies. Yeah, actually have been the principal regions for the last about uh, 12 years. Um, the most fascinating evidence is uh, delivered uh, from these Kolyma sites. They are dimensioned, yes, Irianka and, uh, and Irilak Siena. These maps and uh, coming slides are from our publication from, from Boreas. It is a European journal. Uh, it was published, a uh, paper published in um, 2021. If you want to know some details, yeah, for which there is not really time. Yeah. But anyhow, um, we mapped a series of um, well-preserved sections exposed along river and uh, Kolyma River and uh, tributary uh, streams. The sections uh, encompass uh, frozen peat as well as Yedoma, which is such a clay silty uh, deposit, also uh, including many, many layers or lenses uh, of uh, rich of organic remains. Yeah. And um, um, as seen, on uh, uh, on the, on these diagrams, yeah. So we get radiocarbon dates uh, on these uh, fossiliferous beds on uh, big bones uh, or even on, on smaller macro botanical remains from fifty five uh, up to early Holocene to about nine thousand years ago. So we get a certain uh, a quite a good clue about the changing environment. Yeah, uh, which, however, never was so called to uh, somehow demotivate people not to stay in the area even during the last glacial maximum. Yeah, and um, uh, this is an illustration of one key site, Zirianka, on the Kolyma, and. Uh, uh, again, the column, yeah, the maximum depth is about uh, 13 meters of the single stratigraphic column. Then on the left bar, we have uh, in a um, well, series of various um, biotech records, yeah, twigs, uh, bones, ivory, etc. Then next in the middle part, we have um, radiocarbon dates, yeah. And uh, uh, standard uh, stratigraphic or sedimentological and faces analysis, the corresponding and the corresponding photographs of uh, of this fossil fossiliferous and cultural material bearing deposits. Yeah, so it's like, it's like uh, creating the pages of a book to read, isn't it? 
Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what is fascinating is the uh, are the riches of the fossil fossil biota or palo biota of different kind. So this is just uh, an illustrative diagram. Yeah. Uh, again, I just to remind you also um, or stress that the age of this biota is about from 50,000 almost to 24,000 or even some going to 18,000 through the last glacial maximum. So we have- And how well preserved it is. Well, how they preserve, that's a good question, but a very, very simple answer. This, uh, this stuff, these materials of this kind on the photographs and many others were uh, frozen in a very, I mean, hard, hard uh, frozen state, yeah, in a solid ice or cryolithic formation for 40,000 years. Or Nature's 50. cryogenics, yeah. Yes, exactly. So we have macro botanical remains, yeah, we have uh, uh, including uh, branches Wood. of. Uh, of uh, wood uh, of, plant um, bone and tusk oh my gosh yeah uh, including branches of large uh, willow birch yeah we have a bunch of uh, megafauna bones yeah but also we have fossil coprolites yeah here okay. on the left down corner shows and, you uh, what they ate yeah yeah so we know what they ate and they basically uh, from the analysis we know so they ate what was available in the surrounding area, what is the traditional diet of these big herb herbivores, or used to be, yeah. And uh, the analysis, the biotic analysis plus pale paleo palynology analysis, it gave us the picture of the environment, and this is very important, uh, which was uh, not too much unlike to the present one. So. Uh, people simply roamed or behaved or lived in the setting which is uh, very close to the modern setting. And that would be yeah. a paradise for them, wouldn't it? it I, I think it was exact, exactly a paradise because uh, the amount of fauna that we have from these paleontological sites, and uh, I must uh, stress that these sites are just is a fraction of what we find, what is underneath the surface. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it used to be like a, a last glacial or periglacial savanna, mm -hmm. uh, comparable to the sub Saharan Africa. Yeah. But even, uh, I mean, because of uh, uh, the density of people uh, was much lower than, is, than it is in Africa. So obviously, I mean, the amount of, um, of uh, big uh animals mammals mm -hmm. uh roaming or herd animals was really very high yeah and right. as a and there was no this, borders there was no homeland security uh, protecting yeah. any border there were no borders yeah. of course they would go into this area wow well, yeah. and uh, just the borders was the arctic ocean yeah, the coast yeah, yeah. but uh, animals reach this uh their very uh big size because of the territory which was mm -hmm. open and uh, which also uh, supported them at very high biotic potential so the biomass mm -hmm. was very it was basically un unlimited yeah, so it was so a paradise for those animals yeah, as well so therefore the animals also reached a very high mm -hmm. very very big size yeah mm -hmm. uh larger than let's say in europe yeah and as a reminiscence or the uh, uh, reflection of the adaptation we have in this uh, dwarf mammoth, which reach eventually the size of cows on the Wrangell Island after uh, after during the post glacier, yeah, mm -hmm. because they got isolated in a small setting, yeah, uh. geographical and poor, biotically poor setting. So they have to adjust, and from big mm -hmm. animal, from big mammoth, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got a mammoth adult size of a cow. Yeah. So this was yeah. also opposite case. Here uh -huh. in in mid Wisconsin, and we had very big animals and mm -hmm. many, many of them. And indeed, in Wisconsin, are... referring to the era, not to the state. But I want to say that um, as Mike Gramley, who I want to thank for introducing me to all of you, um, he was saying that 
ma- mammoths eat the grass on the steps, but mastodons eat the the trees and the brush, the woody material. So, yeah. 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 Well, uh, again, uh, we had, except for mammals, we had also other herbivores, like, right. uh, I mean, the high frequency of analysis, we got uh, woolly rhinoceros, we have bison, we have horse, yeah. So all of them uh, prefer more open environment, yeah. But mm-hmm. uh, I mean, some bushes or isolated trees, what was the picture that we got is was part of the mosaics, environmental or mm-hmm. paleo landscape mosaic. A, a patchwork yeah. of yes. various yeah. micro climates. Yeah. Yeah. I also actually mentioned that some of these uh, uh, remains um, with uh, human showing traces of human modification or, or paleolithic modifications are being used as stone tools or even just uh, being crushed for marrow extraction, like mm-hmm. like here, mm-hmm. yeah, these two points. Those fat points. calories were yeah. important to them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they are dated up to 19,000 years ago, and we have repeated dates. So the implication is that people occupied Eastern Siberia, even during the peak of the last ice age. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, well, if you have the Inuit who we know survive and found ways to survive in a very cold environment, then um, with the, their clothing and their tools and their, their igloos and buildings, I mean, why wouldn't other people have de- developed those same techniques to survive in such a cold environment? Yeah. If one group can do it, then certainly humankind has found a way to do it. And that would have been available to even earlier groups. Yeah, I think in the past there was a tendency to underestimate the capabilities of early people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, this has been changing already um, during the last year. So, uh, I mean, if we accept uh, this uh, this knowledge of uh, adaptation of uh, now we are talking about Homo sapiens sapiens, considering the eight. That yeah. it's about 20, 19, 18,000 years in Eastern Siberia. Why this not should have been or might have not been the case for North America? Yeah, right. And, we put a time uh, Alaska, stamp on innovations. Yes, it at least and Alaska, allows us to ask the questions and to consider the evidence. Yeah, and Alaska, we have the same basically. We have the same environment like in Colima. Yeah, mm-hmm. so. Okay. Some ice fields, are glaciated mountains, yeah, uh, in the north and south, but uh, periglacial setting in the middle, yeah, like we have Cherskovo and Verkhoyansky range, which were just partly glaciated because of aridity, uh, but periglacial settings which hosted animals, but evidently also people, yeah, and uh, uh, here we have just a. Uh, uh, short like synopsis of these uh, dates and material uh, from the Kolima locality from Zirianka and Irilaxiana and also uh, providing information about what kind of material was dated. Yeah? And uh, the dates go from 44, they run from 44 yeah, up to 9,000, up, uh, up to early, early Holocene. Yeah. Now, I would like to cross the Bering Strait now, uh, once again, just for illustration. So we were talking about this place here. So just uh, very close to Chukotka, yeah, Ch- Kamchatka, Chukotka. So we were talking about Eastern Siberia, Yakutia over there. And we have the Bering Land Bridge, which uh, existed at a certain uh, width uh, mm-hmm. during the entire mid-Wisconsin and during more than 30,000 years, plus additional uh, 15,000 years during the late last glacial. Yeah? The knowledge, um, the data, palynological data, retrieved from this broader area of Beringia from Alaska or from Eastern Siberia to Alaska shows uh, even during the last uh, glacial maximum, very a very, I mean, cold environment, but also very biotically uh, sustainable. Rich. Yeah, yeah, very rich. Yeah, so we have grasses, we have uh, flowering plants, we have moss. Yeah, we have some dwarf trees. 
Again, no barrier for mammals to move around. So it means for no people. And at the same time, let's say 20,000 years ago or uh, 24,000 years ago, we have in Europe, uh, like in our country, in my country, in, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Czech Republic, in Moravia, we have these famous sites, uh, Pavlov, the only Vestonica. So the Venus figurine made of, uh, of, uh, of clay, yeah, very sophisticated uh, bone tools. Yeah, and not just there, but also, as I said, in Eastern Europe, in Southern Siberia, in, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Baikal region. Yeah, so why Cultural not- transmission. To, yeah, yeah, why not to consider in the same way that cultures expanding already far east, yeah, to, to North America, yeah. So our research that um, was already commented on uh, took place in uh, along the Rocky Mountains in Alberta and British Columbia and part in Central Yukon, but mostly here in, in uh, Central and Southern Alberta, where uh, a uh, collision uh, co or coalescence of the ice uh, we have documented just for the last glacial maximum yeah, considering uh, the time span from the uh, from the mid to last glacial to the Holocene so just about uh, about uh, this uh, this line as it is uh, uh, as it is shown on the map and the southern part of the territory farther south, towards Montana yeah, or Idaho, it was ice free. So if uh, we believe that people came uh, to, to North America prior to this collision of two ice masses, so uh, they, may have, they may have stayed again and uh, practice certain adaptation as their cousins farther north in Alaska, unglaciated Alaska, already in, in southern Alberta or in northwestern the United States. Yeah. So the key site that was investigated by me uh, was in Bow Valley, just um, on the outskirts of um, the city of Calgary, discovered by 1991. Yeah. The geology of the site. Um, includes uh, uh, tertiary bedrock, then we have uh, uh, preglacial gravels. It means gravels uh, mm -hmm. accumulated by a river mm -hmm. uh, during the mid Wisconsinan, so during the moderate favorable environmental conditions similar as to the present ones. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, glacial tails uh, or glacial deposits uh, derived by ice expanding from the Rocky Mountains uh, around 24, 23,000 years from now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, on top, we have uh, glacial lake Calgary sediments. Oh boy. Yeah, yeah, that relate to the expansion of the ice from the north. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was when the, when the ice blocked the river, the Bow River flowing from the west and created a glacial lake, yeah? So this is, this is the story from the point of view of a geologist, yeah? And now we try to accommodate archaeology into this uh, picture, yeah? Mm -hmm. So still before doing so, we have a, this is a shot of a glacial tail, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, on the top of beach, we found archaeological, we uh, uncovered archaeological horizon. Yeah, so this is a glacial tail from the ice, which expanded from the Rocky Mountains about uh, uh, 24 to 22,000 years ago. But the ice retreated before the northern ice expanded yeah, and created a lake. So there was a time span for several thousands perhaps or a minimum hundreds to thousands of years yeah which is uh, uh, illustrated by the presence of archaeological uh, industry of stone tools yeah ah. so yeah, they would the go to the lake, they? Yeah. yeah so and the glacial lake when the ice already retreated so 
uh, uh, there was an immigration of uh, vegetation mm -hmm. and uh, 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 including we have some bones, we have we have people, yeah, and uh, uh, this uh, kind of environmental uh, solid environment it lasted for for some time before the northern ice expanded and created mm -hmm. different conditions and sealed mm -hmm. the site, uh, including the archaeological layer by fine clays. Yeah, so very uh, fine deposit. Put a nice so lid on it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So there was no glacial like uh, bulldozing, not at all. So we but left it we had no, no ice. Yeah, we had just glacial water. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, the top, the ceiling, twenty-five meters of glacial like calgary deposits are documented here. Yeah, on this slide. Wow. Yeah, the, the archaeological layer is somewhere here. Mm -hmm. This is the um, just a. Uh, um, aerial photograph yeah, of the erosion. And uh, when I started my talk, so when I was a student and just going around this section, so these were the sections I used to live some, I, I used to be living somewhere here on the other side <laughs> of the, just opposite. It put and, you right there, didn't it? Yes, Find and it. it was like on hand, yeah, on the plate. So I yeah. went and I started to pick up the, the nice stone tools just from these deep erosions. Start I'll just have a little hike in the neighboring yes. walls and look what I find. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is the final. I mean, the most comprehensive phot photograph uh, that could be provided. I mean, for 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 uh, for illustration. So we have glacial like Calgary tail, which mm -hmm. is this stuff here. Yeah. yeah. It is this, and we have glacial like Calgary sediments over there, which are these. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have the uh, archaeological layer, which is between the two major formations. Each of them documents uh, a glaciation, yeah, but uh, uh, not a coalescent glaciation because independently by mm -hmm. geological studies, the coalescence was just in mm -hmm. northern Alberta, yeah, not in southern Alberta, where we are now in our talk. Yeah. Two different so glaciation tills, two different deposits. Yeah, one tail and one mm -hmm. lake. Yeah, the tail mm -hmm. is there, the Bow Valley. It was the glaciation going from the west, then retreated. People mm -hmm. moved in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they can and be then, in that layer. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they live in the archaeological layer behind them. And then we have expansion of the ice from the north that stopped somewhere in the vicinity of Calgary and created a glacial lake. Yeah. Got it. Wow. So the, to summarize the Calgary archaeological evidence, so the context, they are deeply buried 20 to 30 meters in late places in deposits. So even, I mean, below the glacial lake and this notion to have a site which is uh, 25 meters underneath the present ground was something unperceivable yeah, for my colleagues. Yeah? But this is real. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The lithic industry, uh, they are percussion flaked stone tools. Percussion, it means you held firmly one cobble or yeah, raw material in one hand and mm -hmm. high velocity controlled flaking in an open air environment, you smash yeah, the cobble and in a control flaking, you, you try to produce the desired item. Yeah? So this is not a random, some crushing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, Are and, we gonna see uh, those tools as well? Yeah, we have, we have consistent typology and technology, yeah, and that culture diagnostic attributes, which are identical that, uh, to those that we found in Central Europe, that we found in Eastern Europe, that we found in North Africa, in, uh, in, uh, in India, yeah, where uh, the old politic studies, though the previous old world politic studies are well established. But also we have them, the same kind of attributes, we have them, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, evident on the polyamerican industries, yeah, because uh, mm -hmm. the American, uh, the first or post glacial, I would say, not first, the post glacial uh, settlers of the prairies, they had these nice projectile points that I will show later on, yeah, but they also used simultaneously uh, expedient industry, so expedient stone tools 
for uh, for flaking for for doing some kind of activities for which they did not need to curate yeah they produced artifacts they simply throw them away yeah and they curated just the spear points for for killing big animals yeah for bisons or whatever right yeah so some of these materials this is the uh, stone tool that i mentioned but this is uh, to which we have 18 uh, flakes which can be attached to yeah so one two three four five six and the same from the other side this is the side view yeah mm -hmm. this is this is another instrument yeah on the left side the drawing yeah and <clears throat> as i said it's uh, impossible that you would have uh in uh in an environment on top of a gravel floor sealed mm -hmm. by low energy clays mm -hmm. Uh, uh, a setting which would allow for production of such in controlled way manufactured mm -hmm. lithic object. I mean, there is purposeful, no way. Purposeful napping. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, everybody who, who knows, I mean, have some idea about napping, mm -hmm. uh, uh, make some experiment, uh, experiments as I, as mm -hmm. I did. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's definite. Yeah. And um, Lit napping is a, a precise skill as well. So. Yes, yeah, and I and I show this tool, uh, which is in original in the provincial museum in uh, of Alberta in Edmonton. So if you, any anybody would like to have a look, so I just can recommend to go there. Yeah, I have just cast yeah of it, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, yeah, but uh, this item was uh, located on a gravel floor. Yeah along with 18 the, uh, detached flakes uh, on a, uh, within a space of about two or three square meters, mm -hmm. buried by 20, 25 meters of clays, clay silty sediments of Glacier Lake Calgary. So when the lake very slowly started to fill the uh, former uh, valley, the Bow River Valley, yeah, and inundated the former site. Yeah. So this is this is the, this is the story. Yeah. <clears throat> Another example. So we have course. Yeah. Including course like this. I mean, imagine there is this is a view from top. Yeah. This is a platform, and we have four control blows. Yeah. From mm -hmm. top to detach nice prepared platform flakes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eventually used for scrapers yeah or yes. whatsoever yeah <clears throat> um these uh, these photographs are just for comparison yeah so on the left side we have the calgary such a bifacial core yeah again a sinuous ridge yeah so one blow another next next and the same we have here yeah uh this is Calgary material, and this is material of the analogous piece from from Siberia, from the Ural Mountains. Yeah, I see. the same scrapers. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. Calgary and Siberia. Mm -hmm. The left Calgary, right Siberia, identical flake in the patent. Yeah, <clears throat> similar flakes, similar industry, like what we have from the Upper Yana from uh, from uh, from uh, say from Siberia this is at a high site dated to 26 to 32,000 years ago from permafrost including mammoth remains so we have the same industry very similar one in Calgary but without the remains yeah mm -hmm. so in the story about we the, just haven't found those yet perhaps yeah yeah and how the site, where the site was located, this is indicated, the location of the early site is indicated by this black circle, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, the ice, yeah, as it flows from the north, yeah, the late Wisconsin and house, ice, all our entire ice, yeah, just uh, stopped at these western limits of uh, city of Calgary. They blocked the channel of the Bow River and created the lake which eventually inundated the site in a very quiet way. So, Gentle, so, so it didn't disturb what was there. 
You yes, see? exactly. So absolutely not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in this picture also taken from a publication of uh, not uh, Rutter from 18, uh, uh, 1981, yeah, so 40 years ago, also documents the asynchronity of these uh, two glaciers yeah, from the uh, Rocky Mountains, which expanded and retreated earlier, and the uh, Laurentad ice slope. Yeah? And uh, again, the site is located somewhere there. Yeah? So <clears throat> we searched, and we are, we are heading to the end of my presentation. We search other sites uh, in the province of Alberta. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a photograph of a till, again, glacial deposit uh, um, accumulated by mm -hmm. Laurentat ice. You see, there are no, no stones. Yeah, these are just clays because mm -hmm. most of the distorted mm -hmm. and so called bulldozed formations are uh, pre quaternary, including many badinoceros bones. Yeah, so they are uh -huh. soft. Uh -huh. Yeah, so no, it was low energy basic environment. Yeah, at the base. Yeah, mm -hmm. and at the base of this section, yeah, about 40 meters or 35 meters from top, mm -hmm. we found fossil fauna. Mm -hmm. uh, Mid-Wisconsin okay. mid fauna, which dates also around 35,000 years ago. And along with the fauna, we have a few uh, stone tools, including very nice scraper. Mm -hmm. Well, none yeah. of these, yeah, yeah none, of, none of these has been published yet. So. Just Ooh, documenting. News. I love that. Yeah, yeah, documenting the picture shows the geological or geoarchaeological, geopaleontological context mm -hmm. uh, about 35 meters below the ground. Yeah, from wow. top. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, nobody would look for archaeological material in mm -hmm. such context. Yeah, right. The same you just, you just happened to be in the right place at the right time to find it, didn't you? Well, yes, also, right. being a geologist having that, uh, that, that, that additional feature because otherwise yeah. archaeologists only go a certain level, they're not looking there. Yes. And uh, I mean, we also search through some uh, gravel pits, yeah, like in Villanueva, mm -hmm. uh, gravel pit. Again, and somebody else base. did all the heavy lifting for you, yeah. so exposed yeah. it nicely. Again, at, the, at the base, we have uh, lots of branches, well dated material, including fossil mm -hmm. bones, and also there are. There are a couple of lithics, yeah, including Hammerstone from the same day. Wow. Yeah. Fabulous. Again, unpublished. Yeah, we searched in the same section. I mean, this is the our study environment in, in Alberta. Yeah, so all these sections in the South Saskatchewan River, just north of the US border, they reach up to 100 meters. Yeah, and most of the deposits are uh, rela uh, relate to. Uh, to the uh, late uh, Wisconsin and glaciation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you just uh, go, you just uh, you, you just follow the base of the tail and try to locate uh, interstadial midlast mm -hmm. glacial faces, yeah, mm -hmm. which the most likely, likely place to find it. will host some biotic remains, bones of, okay. of fossil fossil wood, but also which create the environment for geoarchaeological research, yeah, survey for our sites. Yeah. So we have That's finally amazing. we have one site, Eagle Cave in the Rocky Mountains, also prior to intrusion about 24,000, 23,000 years ago. So at the base, below below a blanket of a of a thin uh, glacial deposit, uh, Alan Bryan found um, some lithics, including a wow. chopper, yeah. And, uh, and fractured bones, which were dated 24,000 years ago. So this cave may mm -hmm. have been most likely, was like, most likely occupied by people prior to the last glacial maximum. So the picture of the site that we now from now is uh, documented here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them are located in the same geological and uh, geomorphic context, so in old, Mm -hmm. uh, river valleys, which were filled partly mm -hmm. by uh, by by later glaciers, but uh, not distorting the original uh, mm -hmm. mid Wisconsin and beds. Yeah, so the context, right. uh, the environmental, so and the still in situ. 
yeah it 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 got preserved yeah mm -hmm. and uh, just um, um such a few pictures uh, uh um, to the end uh, showing the environment in which the early people lived uh wow. <laughs> with which they have to Paradise. cope with yeah mm -hmm. so the tundra ice fields but nice mm -hmm. riverine uh river or uh, riverine valleys but also mm -hmm. also uh periglacial steps as in the southern part of the of the of the uh, province of alberta so for the conclusion we have a pattern paleolithic yeah. and i don't uh, mind actually using the term paleolithic yeah uh, or as an equivalent of paleo-american yeah but this is not paleo-indians i think yeah. is the other term right once yeah. they cross the I border say, now these paleolithic yeah. people are paleo-indians if they're in north america yes yeah so, so mm -hmm. that existed here already prior to the last uh, last glacial maximum so mm -hmm. we have the uh, evidence in all these valleys that were investigated, we found in situ, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the best example is the biphase, including 18 flakes from Calgary, yeah, and we have evidence of pre-last glacial, yeah, or pre-LGM occupation of the Western Prairies, yeah, and to the very end, just contrasting pictures, yeah, so this is the story that I, that I was facing, uh, in the early 1990s while coming to Canada or to, to Calgary, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, TP ring, yeah, and, um, uh, and uh, a site, a uh, post-glacial site in a very shallow, uh, close to the surface uh, uh, archaeological context, yeah. So uh, not too old context, so we have the last 10, 12, maximum 12,000 years. So we have corresponding archaeological material. Yeah. So this is this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice projectile points, fancy material. Everybody recognizes it. Yeah. Clovis. Yeah. 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 Well, um, on the map I outlined yeah the migration, the coastal, and uh, so we follow the research along the internal. Yeah. Well, that would make sense because you wouldn't want to go to the mountains. You'd want to go to the lower altitudes where it would be warmer, right? Yeah, and also there where it was fauna. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we have the site, the Bluefish Cave. Yeah. Again, this uh, has been uh. questioned. Yeah. When they dated 2,500 years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. on, we have a bones uh, which uh, show some signs of, of human manipulation, cut marks, yeah, breakage. Yeah, but not everybody recognizes it yet in Siberia. We have plenty of these bones. Yeah. So personally, I would not have any problem with bluefish caves. Yeah. But again, we are back in southern Alberta. We have very big, thick sections which must be explored for early sites. Yeah. And for now, most actually all archaeologists they are just scratching the present surface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody goes deep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, this is the Calgary story. So we are 25 meters, and uh, we have the sectionals, the equivalent sectional in terms of uh, the amount of material, the thickness, uh, less section from the northern Altai Plains. And at the base, we have interglacial, last interglacial sites dated to 120,000 years ago. Yeah, and nobody. So why not go to where they're already yeah, exposed why not, and why take not a look? To, uh, yeah, why not uh, do the same approach here? Yeah, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. if uh, this uh, kind of strategy is being accepted in the old world, yeah, the same here on the Angara River, we have uh, very early sites, uh, 20, 15 meters down. Yeah, we have. Uh, I uh, investigated with my Russian colleagues. A site, uh, uh, one of the earliest Neanderthal site, open air sites in Siberia, in uh, uh, buried in uh, interglacial yeah. uh, uh, soil, paleo soil, which is here. Yeah, it is dark bent. Yeah, and the soil, the site is again sealed by about uh, mm -hmm. 27 meters of less deposits. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that this nice is. Clay. Yeah. yeah. Oh Look at and that. this is the material uncovered from the site. Wow. Yeah. So where so there again, were animals, there could have been. Yeah. So why not do the same approach in Canada? 
Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. If you do it, I'm sure you will find such sites, uh, perhaps not of this age, but very yeah. early ones. Yeah. So yeah. this is the final contrasting picture. Okay. Again, I repeat, this is our investigation from Calgary. Yeah. In uh -huh. the process, I'm the site when it was exposed. It is a picture from 1998. Yeah. This is the biface that I was talking about. Yeah. Nice. Uh, uh, nicely uh, trimmed on both sides, including uh, the bits that uh, belong to it. Yeah, on a very comfortable uh, mm -hmm. low energy environment. Yeah, so right. these are the twenty-five meters of uh, low energy place, burying the occupation site. Yeah, and this is, the, this is this is the post glacial yeah. site. So. If you want to find an early site, you have to search in early context. So this is the story. And this is true mm -hmm. for Siberia as well as for America. So the conclusion is, so search for cultural records should be, should be carried on in stratified, mm -hmm. uh, well geologically described context, yeah. Uh, and uh, well, which are buried, yeah, deeply buried. So no matter how many meters, I mean, if they are, if you have a tail, which is 50 meters deep, yeah. Gotcha. So at least yeah. you have the minimum age for the material, which is underneath, yeah. So this- So what you found by accident, why not yeah. take the lessons learned and start looking at these same strata of the same ages, early, early ages, and see what you can find. We yeah. can't just assume there's nothing there. You've and, demonstrated uh, that there well could be a lot of material there at those stratas mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, yeah. in the geological record. Let's I'm, go look for them because that's I'm, a very important story and we've got people to honor. We've got our yeah. ancestors to honor. We've got our Native American cultures to honor to say, yeah, you've been here a lot longer. Yeah, well, they, Your had, stories they, are have, right. said, they have always said they were here. Yeah. And it was like, oh, listen, that's yeah. sweet of you to think that. And now we have the science Can to we say take they them were right seriously, in the first place. Please. Yeah. yeah. Can we believe their stories? <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that, that was a tour de force. Thank you so much yeah. for that. I want to say that you mentioned the bluefish caves. I was just reading about Jacques Saint Marc, Saint Mars. And yeah. he was he was ridiculed when he started to, he was the excavator. He was the found one that found that 24,000 year old evidence. And he was ridiculed in for decades when he would present this. And I think I was reading how one of his one of the students now took another look with new tools at the dating and the sites and said, yes, 24,000 years old. Here are the cut marks. Here's the here's the points, fine blades. Here's everything you need to say, yeah, no, now it's finally being accepted, but for years it was dismissed. And then there's new DNA evidence um, that supports what you just said. Uh, the, the headline I read, first Americans lived on Bering Land Bridge for thousands of years. Genetic evidence supports a theory that ancestors of Native Americans lived for 15,000 years on this Bering Land Bridge between Asia and North America until the last, last IJ ended. So if you have the 13,000 years from the I, end of the Ice Age to now, 13, 15, and then you have the 15,000 years that they genetically diverged enough for them to calculate, oh, there's enough genetic differentiation between Siberia and Native Americans, must be 15,000 years. Then you, you add up to exactly the, what is it, 48,000 years, 45,000 years, that you were talking about. Yeah. So there's the genetic data as well, confirming what you've just, the story you've just presented. Mm -hmm. So we got the DNA, the geology, the archaeology, it's all coming together. So how yeah. exciting, yeah. how exciting yeah, to, well, I love the shift of paradigms. Yeah, yeah. you see, yeah. What, I, what I don't like is, um, and I didn't like it all it is 30 years ago when I was still a PhD student um, over there, yeah. there was a double standard. Yeah. yeah. Double so, standard. Um, yeah. You you scrutinize a material. I mean, uh, what fits or what doesn't fit. And this uh, Clovis first scenario uh, has been 
very firmly in rooted in North American minds. Yeah. And I mean, this is nice. Yeah. Spear points, uh, modern humans, you know, the good um, uh, hunters. Yeah. So they are just uh, going through uh, like almost invading North America, hunting mammals and uh, bringing them to their extermination. Yeah. And you present in alternative. So more quiet, uh, quiet, uh, random way of uh, opening the country, new territory, simply following on a seasonal basis, the fauna, which in natural ways uh, uh, was migrating across the Bering Strait, the present area of the yeah. Bering Strait, yeah, for many thousand years ago, yeah. So why to exclude humans from the community, yeah? Yeah. These were a part of the community, and you have to practice yeah. the same kind of, of archaeological research, yeah, which has been uh, applied uh, in the old world. So gotcha. why not? Do you the made same such a good case in of that. World, in, yeah, in the in the new world. But also, yeah. what excites me is as James Herod presented here in this forum just a couple of weeks ago, that it's not just the tools, it's the culture that was also left their mark, the culture that also was imported, the culture that also came into the Americas, the cosmology, the symbology, the myths, the stories, the burial practices, the, the culture, the rituals, the ceremonies, it all, it was a complete package that came here. And though it later um, made its mark in these various cultures, as you diverge and you differentiate, there's a common ground here, a common transmission. And so I really am excited by the fact that if I can trace my indigenous roots back to Europe, back to the Paleolithic eras and Lascaux and the painted caves and all that, then if that culture had ties to Siberia, the Gravedian globalization as James explained, and then that came down into the Americas that now we can begin to understand our earliest roots. We can, we can see the shared culture, a mother culture. We can see that we're all tied there at the hip and that we have a legitimate path to return to and reclaim all, all these cultures. I'm part yeah, of this too. I am brother and sister with you. Yeah, I'm part of your family. And I think that's an important realization for us to have. That's very exciting. Yeah. We have yeah. a couple of questions yeah, now I'm to take. Start, start with and Tony. I want to say thank you. Thank you for following the evidence, Yuri. Thank you for becoming the geologist to then go prove your case. Yeah. That was an arduous task to go get your second PhD and to go add another knowledge base a, to your archaeology. It was a fun and pleasure. That was yeah. brave of you. That was dedicated of you. That was arming yourself right. with all you needed to prove your case. You were very lucky to go off on a walkabout and then go find these early tools and then to follow where they led you and then to break open new ground, literally and metaphorically and, and intellectually. I mean, wow, wow, what a story. So bravo. And um, yeah. thank you for pushing the seams of the envelope so diligently and thoroughly. So um, well, I appreciate you sharing with us today. Yeah, yeah, it was a that pleasure. Was tremendously exciting. You know, when so. we did, when we, uh, over the years had done a, a NASA syndicated radio program. We would talk about the fact that we can- Monte Verde, we, we talked about a, the Jomon, we've talked about, yeah. and oh boy, did people fight hard to make their case. But we would do topics yeah. which we considered a mile wide and we looked so forward to finding researchers that could go a mile deep, that could go far. And in your case, not only are we taking the topic deeper, but you physically took the, top, the topic <laughs> deeper. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. Um, Tony, you to dig Tony Hall that. has his hands up, then James. Uh, Tony, here you are. Yes, hello. Uh, yeah, fascinating presentation. I really appreciate what you're doing. Uh, my inquisitive mind was going in a couple of extra directions here. And I'm wondering, what is the duration of the time horizon, both in, in America and in Russia, Siberia? Uh, for example, these very early dates in Siberia, were they, did they endure for a thousand years, ten thousand years, ten years? Do we know that? Uh, sorry, i uh, just. Uh, I don't hear you. Years. Yeah, I don't hear you well. Can you repeat the question? How long were these cultures in Siberia in existence? I'd say forty thousand years. 
No, yeah, well, I, don't well, think, uh, I, I don't is, know, uh, but yeah. it is. I, I understand. I understand the point. Uh, well, this is a question because uh, I don't think we can relate uh, this culture just to one entity. Yeah, I mean, this was a dynamic process of uh, of development, of adaptations, of um, of um, uh, knowledge uh, flows. Yeah, and um, and also of gene flows. Yeah, and all of these constitute certain background for any 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 culture, but. Um, at least by using this uh, this uh, this uh, these terms or this terminology, yeah. So we are we have something to do now. Talking about this uh, earlier mid Wisconsin and this 50, 40,000 years of findings, uh, something with pre-modern people, yeah. And uh, how then it seems there was a certain gap, yeah, because the new new material which uh, shows. Uh, uh, like uh, archaeological or cultural, cultural uh, traces is already well developed upper Paleolithic, yeah, uh, at the uh, earliest so far, 32,000 years. So we have about like 10,000 years of vacuum, yeah. So therefore, we cannot talk about one culture which would go from 50 to 12, yeah, but there were definitely, there was a certain break, yeah. One, one period was ending and another one was starting. And how these two were adjusting to each other, yeah, if it was, it was a question of some, some amalg amalgamation, yeah, or simply a change, it's very difficult to say now, yeah, but. Uh, yeah, this is exactly what I was getting, getting to. Uh, and this is maybe an outrageous question, okay. but could, could the land bridge have been bi-directional? over this very long horizon. And what would that mean? You might have some evidence for that. Well, uh, again, uh, referring to my uh, my arguments or you know, to the evidence, not my arguments, yeah. So we have uh, uh, just uh, uh, taken into consideration the last, uh, sorry, late Pleistocene. Yeah? So the, 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 the time when Land bridge was available, yeah, what is exposed, yeah, uh, and we, it was transpassable from east to west. It was, uh, it took about um, 35, 40, yeah, close to 1,000 years, let's say, wow. yeah. And during this time, uh, I mean, the people could have migrated as they do it on a seasonal basis. In different direction from south to north, okay. uh, from east to west, <clears throat> they did now if they are on the present territory of the United States or of Russia. Yeah, so it was, and to to my knowledge, uh, at uh, I mean, considering the uh, ethnographic analogies from uh, the Siberian north, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the people are able. I mean, the prehistoric, they are able to pass several hundreds or even thousands of kilometers just uh, within a couple of years, yeah? So to reach the Bering uh, State or the Bering, Beringia, the central Beringia, separating the two continents, it was it was a question of not several tens, ten thousands of years or even hundreds of thousands of years, yeah? It was a question of, uh, of a short time when the people were already, already living uh, very nearby the present Alaska, let's say for the first time. And the migration again, going back and forth, why not? Yeah, so. Well, wouldn't there be villages <laughs> populating all of this and people coming back and forth because they were used to vast trade networks, they were used to cultural exchange, they probably had ceremonies where the clans gathered. This was yeah. their home. Why wouldn't this be their home, right? This was land that they occupied. So why would they yeah. treat it any differently than a section of Siberia? Yeah, and we don't know anything about yeah. the <clears throat> migration habits of the megafauna, yeah, yeah? and also uh, about the seasonality, yeah, mm -hmm. about the patent uh, changes in the environment, yeah, which because regulate the the, these, these movements. So the people simply were a part of this ecosystem and they behave accordingly. Yeah, so basically exactly. geographically in all possible directions. So why not 
Mm -hmm. All they knew it was go. more land. Yeah. 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 They didn't conceive it of as, oh, it's a land bridge. They just knew it was land to occupy. Land, yeah, mass of land, yeah, so. And pristine, beautiful, supportive land, yeah. Yeah. Good question, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Anything if else? Could, if I could continue on this, yes. Uh, do we have any idea of when water navigation would become possible? I, I assume uh, the, land, the land migration preceded this, but since there was a clear knowledge of both sides, there might have been an urge as this began to close down to jump in a kayak and, uh, and go, yeah. go both ways. Makes sense. But yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if there's any evidence of that. No, I mean, we don't have any evidence, at least from the Paleolithic of the time, but uh, even, uh, I mean, presuming, uh, I mean, at the very end of the Pleistocene, yeah, when the Bering Strait uh, uh, opened, yeah, uh, I mean, to cross with a kayak, uh, regardless of, uh, of some violent seas, yeah, so in a more quiet conditions, uh, to cross from one side to another must not have been a big task, yeah, because, um, I mean, uh, well, this, this opens up all sorts of beautiful questions. And I really appreciate the yeah, yeah. uh, this, And uh, I, I, I certainly am looking forward to hear how you continue with this and how you rally the support of North American archaeologists. Well, you see, I, well, I'm, I'm involved, actually, I've been involved um, in Paleolithic studies uh, very intensively for the last, well, 35 years. And um, uh, we, are, we, are, we have projects in the Urals, in the Southern Siberia, in, in Yakutia, in Central Asia. And uh, so uh, during this time, this uh, gave me a good, uh, a good deal of experience. Yeah, to, so to, to consider different environments, to orient uh, myself in, uh, in different geo settings, and also to see or to study directly in hands uh, lots of archaeological collections and also the drawings that I uh, that I showed are my own. So yeah. you cannot uh, really uh, make a good drawing uh, without knowing yeah, the lithics, I mean, how they are being produced. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, just a little bit my comment aside, uh, it's hardly to take seriously like the Adversaries of uh, of these um, pre uh, pre Clovis uh, findings, like in Alberta, uh, mm -hmm. who have no experience from the field, uh, they simply comment on the finding from the desk. Yeah? They have no knowledge about geology, yeah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, yeah. well, what we what we what do we want to do? So we are expanding the research farther from the Colima way to to her direction to, to the Bering State, yeah, to Chukotka, yeah, and, uh, and uh, but very much depends the success of the research about the geology, because we have uh, good uh, creolithic formations in, North, in northeastern Yakutia, uh, but in the adjoining Magadan region and in Chukotka, uh, the amount of uh, quaternary beds, I mean, it's much more, or the, their thickness is much more reduced, yeah, because the former uh, geological and sedimentological conditions. So it may not be so easy, I mean, to recover early sites uh, in, in Chupotka, uh, which I would very much like to, to study yeah, over there. But I'm convinced, I mean, there are, there are the sites, yeah, but we have just to, to uh, identify the right context and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and go on. Keep but, us posted uh, on what you find. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's exciting. But I'm just a, a short comment, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm more optimistic, and uh, this is surprising because in Alaska, yeah, we have the earliest uh, data, earliest sites, um, about 13,000, yeah, uh, okay. from now. And uh, yet uh, the geological situation is very, very similar in a certain way uh, to those that we have been studying now in Eastern Yakutia. Yeah, so, and I, then there have been reports about paleoecological sites, about, about the rodent uh, 
uh, nests, etc., dating to the mid uh, mid interstadial mid Wisconsin. Yeah, but uh, uh, no no reports about at least archaeological research. Yeah, uh, studying the corresponding uh, formations, you know, the mid last glacial formations, about which I'm convinced there are archaeological sites that can be well um, recovered um, more or less you well, make quite the case for it and we well, appreciate the, yeah yeah well, the, the danger is that nobody's looking and perhaps the sites are being destroyed because nobody's looking right. yeah that's true, mm -hmm. too. that's true too and yeah. who knows what all that sand tar mm -hmm. excavation is disturbing as well i mean how many sites are we destroying yeah. so thank, thank you. you tony thank for you tony appreciate thank it. You very much. great yeah. insights and you know we have a couple hands up here. Street. James yeah. is ready to go, and then Alan Day wants to follow James. Oh, good. I'm going to. So, yeah. and then um, so we can, here we go. And James is the one that started us off on this. James was here, then he introduced us to Mike Gramley, then Mike Gramley introduced us to Sam Leon Briggs, yeah, yeah. and Paula Steve's coming up, yeah. and Yuri. So, following Yuri, the thread. Look at, look at the, um, the yeah. sequence that you started off, James. My goodness, quite the story. Um, I've. Uh... I want to make sure I understand the lecture, which is an extremely important lecture for people in North America to hear. Um, the seven sites in one of your earlier slides uh, across the Arctic, uh, are they, is there evidence that they are Neanderthal sites or could they be sort of initial upper Paleolithic sites, the ones around 45,000? It's a good question. Yeah, good question. Yeah, actually, this is very, very, uh, very difficult to answer the, the, to this particular question because both both scenarios can apply. Yeah. So uh, if um, the sites belong to the Neanderthals, it means uh, preservation of certain ancient pre-modern population uh, around the Arctic. Yeah, in, in Siberia. Uh, we don't have many sites, but um, I mean, considering the vast space, but at least we have some sites that I showed on the map. Uh, if uh, these sites were uh, early upper Paleolithic, which equally cannot be excluded, this would mean a very rapid spread of modern people across Asia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Basically, from the heartland yeah, of the early upper Paleolithic across through geographic and climatic zones to the extreme corner of Eurasia. Well, but again, considering um, the ability of people, early people that we tend to undervaluate, yeah, so underestimate. Uh, well, I open to this uh, to this notion as well yeah so it's very, just very explain difficult. just a little bit of background so the neanderthal were there for two hundred thousand years in europe and east asia and i mean they really populated the, the, the wide area then modern homo sapiens sapiens us came in about forty thousand years ago they say so there was this period of overlap but could we have come in a little earlier could it be us or could it be them or right this is a very key question and that's why you're asking it james this is something to clarify. Yeah. I guess more evidence needs to be. Yeah, but very difficult. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. impossible, not difficult. It's impossible to answer. Yeah. Yeah. This was the but we, need, we did new sites. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, a little bit um, uh, wow. point which makes uh, uh, the study uh, or the discrimination between Homo. Now the talents in Homo sapiens sapiens in material culture more difficult is that we don't normally the classification is based regard I mean not taking into into account the paleontological evidence or paleoanthropological evidence based on stone industry and most of the of the of the items culture items that we have from from northeast Yakutia are mm -hmm. from bone. Yeah, from astrological material. So we don't have the same kind of data that we could mm -hmm. uh, The cultural compare. material yeah. is scarcer. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Anything else, James? What else? Uh, second question. Um, the, 
the existence of the land bridge during like the interstadials. Um, as I recall reading uh, the climatologist uh, Dyke, D-Y-K-E, uh, Dyke in 2002, uh, in his article, he states that uh, there was no Beringia land bridge uh, during the uh, warmest interstadials. So, is, uh, so how do you view like from interstadial uh, 12, which is like 47,000 years ago, down to uh, the interstadial five, which is 32. Uh, which, wow, which there are not many. One, one uh, sort of geographic uh, mm -hmm. and uh, genetic and tool thing. In that time period, of those interstadials, would you say there was always a land bridge or only in some of them? Interesting. Well, um, there are some studies uh, about uh, paleogeography of the of the Bering land bridge or this this sector, yeah which is in question. And uh, all of these data show that there was some, even uh, I mean, few meters about the present sea level, there was a dry land, yeah. Um, I mean, during the last glacial maximum, I mean, the extent of the land bridge was the broadest, yeah. And also the paleogeography was the highest with respect to this minus, minus 100, uh, 20 meters uh, power of sea level, yeah. But uh, uh, even uh, during the interstadial, as I said, mid Wisconsin uh, entire, there is the knowledge the land was dry. And even, uh, I mean, if uh, during the peak, during the optimum 45,000 years ago, if there was some submergence by a show sea, I mean, we still had a few thousands uh, mm -hmm. years prior to this moment, and at least uh, 20,000 after, yeah, uh, to the end of the interstadia or the dry land. Yeah. So th and, this was you no. Know, it was a short distance if they had a boat or a Yeah, it was very short distance. And, yeah. and there may have been the boats, et cetera. So Not it would hard be, to build a boat to float over. Yeah, it would be speculation. But uh, I mean, generally, uh, there was no physical barrier during most yeah, of the interstadial, during most. yeah, And the interstadial was really 55 to 24. So let's say 30,000 years. And 30,000 years to go yeah, a very short distance, this is, I mean, would be very difficult to argue, argue why not, yeah? Okay, so they say that to populate Australia, the earliest inhabitants there had to do it by boat. They had to go right. that stretch of it over water. So that's 60 or 80,000 years ago, depending on what you read. So this is only 35,000 years ago. So boat technology existed so far back. Yeah. So this is this would not be an in argument, yeah. So right. you can't say it was, but you can't say it right. wasn't. It's, it's, you yeah. could yeah. say it, it's possible, yeah. and more evidence needed. So James, did you have right? Uh, uh, I'm sure he does. Comment. I'm sure he does. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, in the earlier discussion about uh, would the glaciers uh, smash the rocks uh, and, and and create tools. Um, okay. The people I've had conversations with in the Northwest uh, Europe, uh, looking at figure stones and so forth, they report that flint tools from that are exotic to like Germany, North Germany and all, those, those flint tools have come from like Sweden, Norway, where that minerals, those minerals are, or that particular type of flint. Oh. The tools are in perfect shape. So their argument was the glaciers actually absorb the tools and, and move them forward without the them or hitting them against rocks. Oh. And there seems to be multiple people who have got some evidence about that. So I just want to make that comment. Yeah. The second was when I went to field school in Kubifora 
and Paleoanthropology Field School, and we started looking at tools. The first thing they handed out was a one pager which showed you different kinds of uh, activity, fluvial activity that would take possibly take place because they all face the same argument, Olduvai Gorge or wherever. Oh, these aren't tools. They were damaged by waterfall. They were damaged by this or that. Right. And they had a whole system. So that system is at least 20 or 30, is 30,000 years old that they'd worked out in the Kubifora and Olduvai Gorge how you tell uh, bipolar tools basically that have been flaked from others that have been banged around. So it's, it's been there for 30,000 years, but North Americans, because of their uh, bias, unless they're trained in Europe, they don't know anything. Uh -huh. So um, I had that. And then one, and we even went to a waterfall drop. Part of our training was to go look at this basalt that breaks off the top of the cliff, falls down the waterfall drop and crashes into the stones below. And I looked at a hundred tools and hundred, excuse me, a hundred flakes, and there were no tools. So that argument of, you know, smashing stones, unless someone can prove it is wrong. And yeah. uh, okay. one other thing I'm looking at rocks, waterfalls uh, and, and bipolar. These are all bipolar. Oh, the other thing was we we have in North America, which is backwards, in South America, uh, archaeologists have been arguing from Brazil and other sites that they have, you know, these bipolar tools, unifacial and bifacially flaked, that are at least uh, 37,000 years old. Oh, and there's yeah. dozens of sites. Mm -hmm. And so it's again in North America. I don't know if they, the literature is published all the time from South America about these early sites, but they don't, it doesn't seem to be dent the minds of North America much. Like, uh, yeah. I also appreciate the cultural Hartley, transmission that you cite, yeah. James. And, in Hartley, you know, New Mexico, in Hartley, New Mexico, on my list of sites for the time period we're talking about, there is a site in Hartley, New Mexico. 39,000 to 36,000 years old, where they have flakes, which they're pretty sure come from either choppers and also from bone tools. Okay. So that site, I don't know how old now, I don't have my reference to with it, but at least we've known it for 20 or more years. And the next site is El Cedral, Mexico, 38 to 35,000 years ago, the discoid scraper. So, and then into, you know, Vail Parada, Forada and Brazil and all those sites. And those sites also have art. So people should oh. not only be looking for tools yeah. in North America at the yeah. age range we talk about, but also for art. Mm -hmm. They have from the Boquiera Brazil site, 36,000 years ago, painted spalls that have come off the rock walls that have oh. been painted with red ochre. Oh, wow. Have from Vail de Pedra, Parada, 35,000 years ago, not published, but I talked to the excavator from Europe, uh, quote, an unusual hexagonal block that has been polished all over oh. on the site he's looking at. I show me the geological process that does and that. from Santa Alina, Brazil, 28,000, they have ornaments already. So, Wow. We have people coming in from Europe where they all have ornaments at the time period we're talking about of one kind or another uh, into the Americas, you know, at least 40,000 or more years ago. Multiple With migrations. And ornaments, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and, uh, I would uh, just uh, still comment about the um, very unusual for archaeology, the context, the glaciogenic, yeah. Or preglacial uh, context, but uh, Calgary uh, is not the first site uh, which uh, uh, has uh, such, a, I mean, provided such a geological situation. In England, uh, there was a published book about Hoxna site, which is an Achillean site, yeah, uh, which was also covered 
by glacial till during the Anglian ice advance. Yeah, so Anglian period, ice advance, uh, more than 100,000, 150,000 years ago. So it's very early site and which produce nice bifaces, et cetera, et cetera. In a very similar context, like in Calgary, and there is there has been no question about it. Yeah. So because it is in the old world, yeah. But what is unique is the context. Yeah. So simple uh, archaeologists should not uh, like uh, be discriminating anything what what relates to glaciation. On the contrary, a glacial tail. Uh, creates very good uh, terminus. Yeah, uh, antequam the archaeological record dates. Yeah, so even without using any other dating method, you know, simply when we have a glacial till we now the glaciation we reached the area twenty thousand years ago. So we now decide is at least twenty thousand years old. Yeah, it's very simple. So thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wonderful. thank you. Yeah. yeah, and thank you, James, for yours and how you lay that it was just not the tools, it was also the mythologies, the stories, the burial practices, the culture that was transmitted. You were seeing correlations across this bridge. Thank you. Was your presentation, and that's exciting. As well. You know, one, other, one other site to mention in North America is the Huayatla. Co site in Mexico, highly controversial because I did U series of 200,000, but they were open and so the, the dates were not worth it. But the, but the archaeologist who was the most conservative at that site, I think was from Harvard, and she at Unit E by AM, by 14, uh, let's see, carbon, radiocarbon dating with uh, by points, projectile points, knives on blades and flakes, scrapers and burins. Unit E, 39,000 to 25,000 years ago. Uh -huh. So to discard the Sangamonian dates, if one wants to, except they're all confirmed by diatoms, which means somewhere between 130 and 74,000 years ago. But there is that site which was dated by radiocarbon with the, associated with the tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's another site in Mexico. Thank you. Well, oh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the question, stand for a moment. Oh, why aren't we finding more evidence of the of the societies? We find it in Europe. Why aren't if if there were sm at least small bands of people here thirty nine thousand years ago? Why don't we find more cultural evidence? Or are we looking in the that far back? Mm -hmm. Why is it just in the old world, but not here? We don't find it, the abundance of it. Would they, well, um, would they get here, but they, they didn't get to populate? It was more difficult here? Something happened? Well, um, methodologically, I think uh, the first uh, point is that we have to uh, uh, look into in the uh, right places, yeah? And this is not the case. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you again. All right, thank you, James. Okay. Uh, you see, Alan Day has been waiting to also <laughs> share on the conversation. Hi, Alan. Yeah, greetings. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, express my great pleasure in listening to an archaeologist who has a real understanding of geology, geomorphology, and all that good stuff. It is amazingly unusual. Um, Richard Gramley, who's also present here, is uh, another one of those uh, most unusual person. But um, related to that, I would like to send you a, a link to some photos and information on um, lithic artifacts in <clears throat> northern Germany that appeared uh, deep within uh, the Vaxelian glacial till. Uh, very clearly artifacts, um, but uh, categorically rejected by uh, the German archaeological establishment <clears throat> for the most part. Just curious what you think. I have an email address here, uh, Yuri Flockula at amu.edu.pl. Is that right? Yeah, right. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you. Be nice to have Good. the visuals. And yeah, let's take we'll a look. to follow up on that. Yeah. yeah. But you bring really. up a good point. How much material has been lost? And How much material 
um, like by 20. the vagaries of geology and climate and, and conditions or just, we're never going to find yeah, or it was stupidity. disturbed as, yeah. As, yeah. as Yuri's saying this one wasn't. I mean, how, the, of all the evidence that's there, we find such a small slice of it. Yeah. So it's got such a story to tell. Great. So. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Alan. Absolutely. We will follow up if you send that to us as well. Yeah. yeah. Keep yeah. us in the loop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you want to have Gramley final comments? From oh, Gramley? yes. We have to look in the right places. Uh, and that's, can you hear me? Yes. Well, you take it. Sure. Okay. Um, and uh, this is, you have to be discriminating in where you search. And uh, and you, you have to think, uh, there, there are various things you'll learn by looking in different places. But I also want to be able to, one of the problems I would like to take away to alleviate from the very beginning is to date the artifacts themselves. Uh, not the context in which they're found, but if, if possible, using radiocarbon to date the objects. And uh, I'm having some good luck with that. Uh, there are many ways to radiocarbon date, uh, not just standardly on the, using wood, but uh, rather to use bone, uh, antler, and ivory, uh, to use bioappetite fraction, to use calcine bone. I mean, there are many, many ways to radiocarbon date these days, um, and it's given us great freedom as archaeologists. So we go, what we have to do is when we're trying to discriminate objects that may have been made 30 or 40,000 years ago, we, we have to rule out the possibility people at a later date, because of permafrost and others, were able to, and other mechanisms, were able to find much older raw material and put it to good use, just the way the Chinese in the modern day carve mammoth ivory, which is found routinely in the permafrosted areas of Siberia. Uh, so we can't, so it's not to say, you know, they're making jewelry in the modern day of very old ivory. Well, so we've got to be careful to rule th that mechanism out, that possibility out, and there are ways to do it. It involves uh, isotopic analysis of strontium, um, many, many expensive techniques, uh, and we can sort things out. But I want to say that we already may have I'm not saying we do have, but we may have evidence that people were present um, in Kentucky, northern unglaciated Kentucky, 29 to 30,000 years ago. And let me show you. Let me, I just Before I came on, I was preparing this figure. Hold on. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see this. I guess it's breaking news here. Um, here's a hand that's holding this, um, what I can uh, take to be a an ivory diadem. Mike my, my it's And we had, now here's a drawing you. of the same thing. You can see here. Uh, yeah. um, and here's the actual photograph of the three pieces that have been conjoined to make this diadem. Now diadems are headbands and they're very long. If you s can stretch them out, they're like 13 inches long or 14 inches long. Last summer at Lower Blue Lick, in a test trench, we got down to the bedrock and the black gravel above it had fragments, these fragments, which correspond in every respect to diadems present in the old world. They're very common form of jewelry uh, in the Gravettian period. Uh, and, and of course, one of the most famous sites in Russia, Eastern Russia, is the Yena rhinoceros horn site. And they have 44 such diadems. Okay. Uh, and curiously, when I went and radiocarbon dated this diadem, and I dated it twice now, fragments, different fragments, what the one date was 29,440 plus or minus 150, and the other date was 30,090 plus or minus 90. Now, these are raw radiocarbon ages. So these, but that is curious because you see, that's the very age of the Yena rhinoceros horn site. Mm -hmm. in, in Siberia, it's the 28 to 30,000 radiocarbon interval. And here, this 
this diadem, which we have from Kentucky, falls into that. So this is a third possibility, that people coming into the new world, whenever they came into the new carried world. Carried old artifacts? They brought in material? some old artifacts along with them. From mm -hmm. Now, that's another possibility, you see? So uh, I have begun systematic research. I have objects worthy of attention. Um, and I'm, but I've got to rule out all the possibilities and I got to do it pretty carefully before I make extravagant claims, which I'm perfectly willing to accept if I have the evidence that human beings were present in the new world 30,000 years ago. You see, everything is possible. It's possible. But marshalling the proof to the satisfaction of all the nattering nabobs of negativism <laughs> that we, uh, whom we have in the art and in, in our science. Well, they're asking um, good questions, Bramley. Yeah. Uh, by the way, who, who, who's, who's, whom are we responsible for that glorious uh, phrase, nattering the nabobs of negativism, was none other than Spiro Agnew, the vice president. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that <I heard. laughs> That's a trivia question. Yeah. But in any case, so. Jared Yeri, I'm going to. I'm naturally. I'm keeping him informed of all of this. Sure. But mm -hmm. I am beginning the systematic exploration of a site that might yield us convincing evidence. We certainly know there were Provincian hunters there fifteen thousand years ago because they left us a sled that is well dated to that period of time. We've dated all six We runners. appreciate your appearance to tell us all about that. That was fascinating. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. we now we have to pursue the matter a little bit farther. So we know <laughs> people are there with the mastodons, but do were they, the $64,000 question is, were they present at an earlier date when mammoths Rome, the tundra. 40,000 years. Imagine, yeah. though, walking around and carrying from one site to another artifacts yeah. that old, mm -hmm. right? Or did the they find rhinoceros horn material um, in the New World because the rhinoceros were there and then carved? Yeah. So, objects yeah, this from this famous site uh, mm -hmm. where yeah. there are many ornaments. Yeah. I mean, where uh, if processing just, mammoth tusks was routine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, um, it's a truth of today yeah. that we I are just not being like able to... to communicate directly with our Russian colleagues. It's yeah. through people like Yuri directly that yeah. we're able to communicate. At Good all. point, yeah. Yuri. Yeah, Richard, yeah. I just, I just would add. Yeah, I mean, the, the, this data would uh, again um, provide some uh, some support to the idea about a very high mobility of these Ice Age people. Yeah, yeah so they again, were on the move. Yeah, this is what, what I mentioned several times in my presentation. So you, you, you don't need thousands or 10,000s of years to cross certain territory. I mean, we are very close, 1500 kilometers from the prison burning land bridge, and we have a date close to 50,000 years. Right. So why not to visualize the possibility that people simply move yeah, to the northern uh, US and even keep him the original or near nearby ancestries, yeah, some jewelry, yeah, that they uh, valued. Yeah. So my wife has in her jewelry box upstairs, I assure you, <laughs> he has jewelry that's 10 to 15,000 years old and more recent. Uh, and uh -huh. and you know what? She lives in the year 2023. So it's entirely within the realm of possibility that yeah. the first Americans, whenever they were in Kentucky, uh, mm -hmm. brought some heirlooms or very ancient, highly prized mm -hmm. artifacts into yeah. the new world uh, in the form of jewelry um, and, uh, and so forth. But you're right, whatever the proof, whatever, if it happened 30,000 years ago, or it happened more recently, but things moving over a large distance, this is all going to be revealed by strontium isotopic analysis. And, and other tools that will that. develop in the future yeah. as well. Thank you, Gramley. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank yeah. you for the breaking news. I yeah. appreciate that. Those are good questions to yeah, ask. Yeah.
And thank you for introducing us to yeah. Yuri. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and the Paulette whole circle Steves, of who's the, coming June 25th, a uh, native scholar on this. Yeah, but we'll keep so, on the topic. Yeah. Well, yeah. Paula Steves Chapters. is part of our loop. Oh, good. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We've got the whole network here. This is yeah. this is fun. You know, because we had to ask the question and then somebody had this piece, somebody had this piece. Right. We want to keep investigating. We're just asking the question when, and saying, show us the evidence. Yeah. So Yuri, build we, the story out. Yeah. When we, we first can't just dismiss it sorry. out of hand. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was going to say, Yuri, when we first spoke with you uh, two and a half hours ago, you said, oh, my presentation <laughs> Maybe an hour we'll have, and you know, I, I'm used to just doing like, slides and you can see how easily two hours and two and a half hours fill up. And uh, what a, an amazing journey we've yeah. had together today and, and the curiosity of, of everyone wanting to participate and draw that information out as well. So all of you who have yeah. stuck with us this many hours and the TV with us, yeah. we really appreciate thank that. You. But we really want to thank you, Gary, for, for your contributions and your dedication, because this takes... This takes so much energy and the time and focus to come up with this and then also to go against the grain and have those those forces yeah. that don't want to support your work and what you're doing and say, wait a minute, I'm still here. I'm still going to keep doing what I'm doing. And, and also the fact that you have to be on site, you have to see the tools in person yeah. to really understand them. We were in the museums in yeah. Les Zizi and Paris and we saw tools and I didn't know what I was seeing but even just uneducated to look at them, I saw a lot. Right. And then uh, who was it? Uh, Thomas Wynn showing us from his book, um, uh, the First hand Sculpture, axes. Hand Axes to Figure Stones. Right. The detail, he was waxing poetic on a, a tool for 20 minutes yeah. and showing us things about them and the how depth. they were made. And sure. that's the detail. We got to see it with um, Bruce Bradley, experimental right. archaeologist now at Exeter. But when he was in He's Colorado in Cortez, he flint napped for us for two hours explaining the intricacies a leather piece in a leather cape and a, an antler. And he created a Clovis tool showing us and telling us about mm -hmm. the sites, about the, the 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 remnants of it, the caches that were kept yeah. by these people, each stroke and how how why the why so intricate, and so miss, intricate. Yeah. There's so much yeah. to these tools, so it just gives you an appreciation of our ancestors, and this has as well, and how clever how we let's honor our ancestors. And you've helped us do this. You filled in a major chapter today about that land bridge and its accessibility, <laughs> and it's important to us. So thank well, you. Last thank you words so much. are yours. Yeah, Go ahead, yeah, I Yuri. Know it's, getting, it's getting to be bedtime in Poland. So. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I'm very glad to have a chance uh, to have a chance to um, to pass a bit of my knowledge to you and to other listeners and. Uh, well, the topic is uh, from far uh, to be covered completely, even uh, uh, if we take into account just our own investigations in Siberia or in the in the Urals. But uh, uh, while well, I'm personally convinced there are hundreds of early sites uh, in the, in North America which could be readily yeah uh, uh, exposed and um, and well studied and um, evidence properly presented, but as I already said, uh, if you want to find a, an early site, you have to look in early context. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what uh, uh, what is the proviso, the principal proviso for a success is uh, is the right. Uh, Preparation. I mean, to have certain knowledge about geology, about the forces, and uh, well, and also to have open mind and to have experience directly from the field. And um, I eventually, then uh, I think uh, there will be new, new material, new evidence that gradually will become to be accepted by most of North American archaeologists. So I wish uh, to my colleagues good luck in their search and in open mind. And it's so fun to see paradigm shift. It's really exciting to yeah. be right there. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much.